before the Citizenship Act defined the term citizen. The citizenship law was amended in 1986 due to the Assam Accord and in 2003, because of the BJP's opposition to illegal migrants. Unlike the original Citizenship Act that gave citizenship on the principle of jus soli, everyone born in India, the 1986 amendment was less inclusive as it added the condition that in addition to one's own birth in India, one can get citizenship only if either of the applicant's parents happened to be an Indian citizen at the time of birth. The 2003 amendment by the Vajpayee government made the law even more stringent. Now, the law requires that in addition to the fact of birth, either both the parents should be Indian citizens or one parent has to be an Indian citizen and the other not an illegal migrant. The Assam NRC has busted the narrative of several million Bangladeshis illegally staying in India. 1,600 crore rupees was spent on the NRC, which brought Assam to a standstill for five years. BJP leader Hemanta Biswa Sarma has rejected the final NRC and wants it to be undertaken again with the national NRC. It seems most of the 1.9 million excluded from the NRC are non-Muslims. Clearly, the cab is nothing but a face saver for the BJP. But like the flawed NRC, it too is not going to give the desired results, either in terms of deportation or denial of citizenship to one particular community. Opinion, Harsh Mander writes, if Parliament passes the Citizenship Amendment Bill, India's constitutional structure, as we know it, will lose its soul. Moreover, the CAB will put even non-Muslim citizens under severe hardship as those who were till now asserting that they are Indian citizens will now have to prove that they, in fact, came from these three countries. The CAB is against five of the BJP's primary positions. First, the BJP manifesto for the 2016 Assam Assembly election had promised honoring the Assam Accord in letter and spirit. Second, it had been advocating that the cut-off date should be July 19, 1948 not March 25, 1971. The new bill has brought forward the cut-off date to December 31, 2014. Third, though the BJP has been using all kinds of adjectives against illegal migrants, the CAB deems such illegal migrants as citizens and abates all proceedings against them under the Foreigners Act, 1946. Fourth, the argument that refugees or illegal migrants are a burden on national resources does not stand any longer. Fifth, the statement of objects and reasons to the bill takes strong exception of a particular religion, being declared as state religion in Afghanistan, Pakistan and Bangladesh. Does that mean the Hindu right no longer wants to make India a Hindu rashtra? The cab is in the teeth of Article 14, which not only demands reasonable classification and a rational and just object to be achieved for any classification to be valid, but additionally requires every such classification to be non-arbitrary. The bill is an instance of class legislation, as classification on the ground of religion is not permissible. Neither is religious persecution the monopoly of three countries nor is such persecution confined to non-Muslims. Religious persecution is rampant in China and Myanmar. Several Muslim groups such as Hazaras in Afghanistan and Shias in Pakistan too face persecution. The Supreme Court in E.P. Royapa, 1973, observed that, equality is a dynamic concept with many aspects and dimensions and it cannot be cribbed, cabined and confined, within the traditional and doctrinaire limits. From the positivistic point of view, equality is antithetic to arbitrariness. In fact, equality and arbitrariness are sworn enemies, where an act is arbitrary, it is implicit that it is unequal both according to political logic and constitutional law and is therefore violative of Article 14. Finally, if those who support the CAB think the bill would be able to take away the citizenship of billions of Muslims, they are wrong, the CAB would apply to only Muslims who have migrated from Pakistan, Bangladesh and Afghanistan. Moreover, citizenship once conferred cannot be retrospectively revoked. The bill is unnecessary. If we care for refugees, India should sign the Refugee Convention and make illegal migrants eligible for citizenship. Strength in numbers, on judge vacancies, the Hindu. The list of alarming numbers and figures relating to the depleting numbers in India's higher judiciary has a new addition. 
On December 10, the Supreme Court of India said that 213 names recommended for appointment to various high courts are pending with the government. Data show that 38% of all sanctioned posts for high court judges are lying vacant as of December 1, with the high courts of some states including Andhra Pradesh and Rajasthan functioning at below half their actual capacity. The court has fixed a time period of six months to appoint as judges at least those whose names the Supreme Court Collegium, the high courts and the government have agreed upon. At each level of the appointment process of judges to the higher judiciary, prior to the names reaching the Prime Minister and President for final approval, there are time periods specified. The Memorandum of Procedure states that appointments should be initiated at least six months before a vacancy arises and six weeks of time is then specified for the state to send the recommendation to the Union Law Minister, after which the brief is to be sent to the Supreme Court Collegium in four weeks. Once the Collegium clears the names, the Law Ministry has to put up the recommendation to the Prime Minister in three weeks who will in turn advise the President. Thereafter no time limit is prescribed and the process, seemingly, comes to a standstill. The Supreme Court's recommendation now of a time limit to these appointments is welcome. It is no secret perhaps, that the equation between the court and the union government has been strained by the former's decision to strike down as unconstitutional in 2015 the move to set up a National Judicial Appointments Commission which would have been responsible for appointments and transfers to the higher judiciary in place of the Supreme Court Collegium. Since then, reports of delays in appointments have become increasingly commonplace, with both sides testy over procedure. Last week, the same bench of the Supreme Court chastised the government for not acting on another set of nominations on which the government had sent back objections. If the Collegium reiterates the names, the court said, the government has no option but to appoint the judges. Such standoffs are now inevitable. As grievous as it is for the government to disrupt the process through delays, it is for the court to take an increasingly firm hand to ensure that the collegium system that it fought so hard to protect, despite flaws, actually functions effectively. Doing so would be in its best interests. Vacancies in the higher judiciary threaten every aspect of the justice delivery system and it is the courts, and very seldom the government, that always take the blame for any shortfall in justice. Staggering spread, on vaccines, the Hindu. Even as reported measles cases globally during 2000-2018 decreased by 59%, there has been a spike since 2016. Compared with over 1, 32,000 reported cases in 2016, the numbers shot up to over 3, 53,000 in 2018. While the numbers in 2018 were more than double the previous year, the numbers in 2019 have already surpassed those of 2018. By mid-November 2019, over 4,000 cases were reported globally. Since measles surveillance is generally weak, WHO and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention resorted to estimating the number of measles cases and deaths. Based on an updated estimation model, there have been nearly 10 million cases and over 1, 42,000 measles deaths in 2018. Last year, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Liberia, Madagascar, Somalia, and Ukraine accounted for 45% of all reported cases. The situation worsened in Congo by November, with a nearly four-fold increase in cases, from 65,000 in 2018 to 2, 50,000 in 2019, and over 5,100 deaths. The situation in Ukraine is grim. After a 50% drop in the number of cases in 2018 compared with 2017, the trend has now reversed, 58,000 cases by mid-November this year, which is 4,000 more than in 2018. There has been a decline in the other three countries mentioned that reported the most number of cases last year. Vaccine hesitancy has been highlighted for the staggering spread in cases globally. In Dr. Congo, there is low institutional trust, misinformation, vaccine shortage and even attacks on healthcare centers and workers leading to the spread of both measles and Ebola. The Philippines and the small Pacific island of Samoa serve as a textbook case of the sudden emergence of vaccine hesitancy. 
Mass immunization using a newly approved dengue vaccine in Philippines, before the risks associated with the vaccine were reported by the manufacturer, shattered public trust in vaccines, so low vaccine coverage led to measles and polio outbreaks. In Samoa, an error in preparing the measles, mumps, and rubella MMR, injection led to the death of two infants. Fear-mongering led to a fall in vaccine uptake, leading to an outbreak of measles. But in many European countries in the U.S., vaccine hesitancy has been on religious grounds and primarily due to anti-vaccination campaigns spreading fake news about vaccine safety. To counter rising hesitancy, about a dozen European countries have already introduced laws making vaccination mandatory. New York City too introduced such a law when the U.S. nearly lost its measles elimination status. Such laws may prove counterproductive in the long run, and the only way to increase vaccine uptake is by educating the public. With 2.3 million children not vaccinated against measles last year, India has much to do to protect its young citizens. The not-so-bright idea of selling the family silver, the Hindu. The government may not be striking pay dirt and privatizing public sector undertakings, especially the profitable BPCL. When we examine the proposed stake sale of profit-making public sector undertakings PSUs, a few strategic issues of national importance need to be considered. The first is an ideological one, that government must get out of business. The second is the need to bring the fiscal deficit down. The third is a long-term financial one, which option, public or privately owned, is better for the government treasury. A fourth is about national security and self-reliance, can India be under pressure if we do not have full control over petroleum? Why do the United States, China and other superpowers have control over their petroleum reserves? Number crunching. Let us look at the long-term financial issue. The Burma Shell, Acquisition of Undertakings in India, Act 1976 enabled the government of India to take ownership by paying 27.75 crore rupees. One estimate of that amount in today's terms is to use the inflation factor, which is about 22.42, between the year 1976 and now. This means that the government would have paid 622.06 crore rupees today. The current market value of Bharat Petroleum Corporation Limited BPCL, varies between 85,000 crore rupees and 115,000 crore rupees. The government's share at present is about 53.3%, which it is contemplating selling, that is worth between 45,000 crore rupees and 61,500 crore rupees. We got the company for a song. How much has the government earned meanwhile? Since 2011, the total dividend it has earned is about 15,000 crore rupees, which is several times the present value of the investment of 622 crore rupees. Let us estimate the present value of all future incomes that the government would earn. One way is to use inflation and calculate what the value of all future flows would be, based on the present value of all future incomes. The average inflation in the last three years has been 4.5%, 3.6% and 3.48% in 2016, 2017 and 2018, respectively, or an average of 3.86%. If the government sells its entire stake, it would forego future income of about 78,589 crore rupees. In addition the BPCL has also paid taxes of about 25,000 crore rupees to the government since 2011. No doubt the government will continue to get taxes from the private sector as well. However, the effective tax rate on profits before tax for the BPCL is about 34%, whereas for the private sector player it is between 25% and 28%. So there will be a loss in tax revenue for the government after any privatization. In summary, financially, we as a nation are worse off by selling such a profitable venture. As the case of the BPCL and several other PSU, Navratnas, show, they have given super normal returns to the public exchequer. Instead of selling such high-performing PSUs, should we not be selling the loss-making ones? Issue of Fiscal Deficit Target Another issue underlying the disinvestment is the fiscal deficit target of 3.4%, now reduced to 3.3%. 
There are many ideological debates among economists about the importance of reducing the fiscal deficit, but we leave that to the experts. Given that revenue collections are not enough, the government is perhaps planning the sale of well-running PSUs to meet the fiscal deficit target. If the government is meet its fiscal deficit target by the stake sale of various PSUs including the BPCL this year, how would it meet that target next year? Note that in spite of the huge one-time dividend from the Reserve Bank of India, we are far from meeting the deficit target. Nothing much will change in terms of the expenditure or revenues in the coming years. These strategic sales and dividends cannot be repeated every year. We will be back to the same levels of fiscal deficit. The real way of meeting this target is to cut out wasteful government expenditure, most of which is on salaries and pensions, and ensuring that the bureaucracy delivers. Unfortunately, the cuts will be in the social sector. On national security. The ideological issue of government versus private ownership is related to the strategic issue about national security. Natural resources, especially oil, are a strategic national resource. The United States maintains such an underground crude oil reserve to mitigate any supply disruptions. Some comparative figures for such reserves are, the US over 600 billion barrels, China 400, South Korea 146, Spain 120 and India 39.1. India does have a target to substantially increase its reserves. At today's prices to reach Chinese levels of reserves we will need nearly 2 lakh rupees crore, which is 10% of the central budget. Even if we spread this out over several years, it is still a lot of money. There are two, state-owned, Chinese companies in the top five oil companies, in fact Sinopec is the world's second largest, just behind Aramco. While China sticks to state-owned national resources, we are moving in the opposite direction. National security also depends on the economic power that a government has. We do have plans to build perhaps the world's largest refinery in India, with the help of Saudi Arabia, but ownership and control will be in foreign hands. Meanwhile with the strategic disinvestments, we will lose government control over both crude and refining. Nothing prevents China or any other country for that matter from buying up refining capacity in India. Is this strategic disinvestment akin to killing the goose that lays the golden eggs? Financially we are worse off, and strategically the nation finds itself in a vulnerable situation. We need to see through the ideological narrative coming from the developed nations. They embraced free trade when it suited them and are now trying to embrace protectionism. China adopted a market system but does not allow this to cloud its thinking when it comes to strategic national issues, the control then remains with the government. India too needs to rethink its strategy. Trilakan Sastri is Professor, IIM Bangalore. BHU lets down BHU, the Indian Express. By Editorial, updated, December 11, 2019, 11 hours 48 minutes and 33 seconds p.m. Had the BHU administration put its weight resolutely behind Firas Khan, he would not have been forced to seek alternative employment. Following a month-long protest by students of the Faculty of Sanskrit and Banaras Hindu University, newly appointed Professor Firas Khan has had to step away to the Sanskrit program at the Faculty of Arts. This is despite the support of several colleagues at the university, including the teacher who had appointed him, who insist that he is perfectly qualified to teach Sanskrit literature, and that his religious affiliation is immaterial. Therefore, the blame for this breach of the fundamental right to freedom conferred by Article 19 of the Constitution, which includes the right to work as one wishes, must rest with the Vice-Chancellor's office. Had the BHU administration put its weight resolutely behind Firas Khan, he would not have been forced to seek alternative employment. Khan's case is ironic because the faculty whose students have forced him out was established in 1918 by Pandit Maidan Mohan Malviya, shortly after he founded the BHU, with the purpose of purging society of misconceptions and fundamentalisms in matters of faith and spirit. It was a progressive project for promoting the study of the Sanskrit shastras and literature. The case is doubly ironic because the study of Sanskrit texts crossed the religious divide centuries ago. 
Neither the Panchatantra nor ancient Indian mathematics would have reached the rest of the world without the energetic intervention of Central Asian and Middle Eastern translators. And while Darashiko is remembered for his interest in translating Sanskrit literature into Persian, it was a project patronized by the state repeatedly through the Mughal period. Firas Khan himself comes from a Sanskrit literate family. All his siblings are conversant in the language, though not enough to teach, and his father makes a living singing bhajans. The history of Sanskrit stretches far beyond the footprint of Hinduism, to the Caucasus and the Hellenistic world. It is rich and layered, and cannot be reduced to the stiflingly narrow rubric of religion. If students deny a professor the right to teach Sanskrit literature only because he bears a Muslim name, they do not understand the subject they study. And if their university bows to their pressure instead of sticking up for the teacher, it is in desperate need of a more broad-minded and courageous administration. Indeed, the administration must bear the brunt of the blame for this incident, since it is presumed, in this case, erroneously, to know better than the student body. For all the latest opinion news, download Indian Express app. Tags. BHU. Brute Majority, Citizenship Amendment Bill, Indian Express Editorial. By Editorial, updated, December 13, 2019, 11 hours 30 minutes and 4 seconds am. This is not a law that concerns those it seeks to include, six minority groups from three countries. It is a political signal of a terrible narrowing, a chilling exclusion, directed at India's own largest minority. The passage of the Citizenship Amendment Bill 2019 is historic but not for the reasons that Union Home Minister Amit Shah called it so, while moving the bill in the Rajya Sabha. In the guise of writing what it calls a partition wrong, and giving refuge to persecuted minorities from neighboring countries, the Narendra Modi government has bulldozed a poisonous bill through parliament which affects a majoritarian recasting of the very idea of Indian citizenship, makes religion a criterion. This is not a law that concerns those it seeks to include, six minority groups from three countries. It is a political signal of a terrible narrowing, a chilling exclusion, directed at India's own largest minority. India is to be redefined as the natural home of Hindus, it says to India's Muslims. And that they must, therefore, be content with a less natural citizenship. The responsibility and blame for this offensive law, this tragic moment, rests squarely on the BJP, the party of Narendra Modi and Amit Shah. The party that proclaimed Sabka Sath, Sabka Vikas, Sabka Vishvas, has diminished the people's mandate in interpreting it as a license to push through this impoverished and shrunken idea of citizenship after piloting a national register of citizens process in Assam that has ignited religious and ethnic fault lines and pushed locks of Indians to the edge of statelessness. The region is seeing renewed violence on the cab. It brings in this law not long after revoking Article 370 in Kashmir in a way that silenced and relegated the Kashmiri people, and continues to isolate them. In the gallery of shame, after the BJP and alongside it, are many of its allies who have earlier professed allegiance to a secular, capacious idea of India. Men like Nidish Kumar, chief of the JDU, and chief minister of Bihar, who has, in his previous political incarnations, spoken long and loud for an inclusive national landscape more sensitive and respectful to the concerns and rights of its minorities. Men like Ram Vilas Paswan, whose voice has always rung louder than tiny LJP's electoral clout, and who once walked out of a BJP-led ministry because of the bloodletting in Gujarat under its watch. The political crime scene today bears the fingerprints of all those partners and allies that earlier nudged the BJP to pitch its tent wider, and are unabashedly cozying up to it today in its terrible shrinking. Shah has assured the Muslims of India that they have no reason to fear, that they are and will remain citizens of the country. It will be a sad day for India if India's Muslims have to take this or any home minister's word for it. India is a constitutional democracy with a basic structure that assures a secure and spacious home for all Indians, including and especially its minorities, and this architecture has endured, by and large. The Citizenship Amendment Bill 2019 should have been stopped by the legislature things should not have come to this pass. Citizenship law proposed nationwide NRC will revise conception of group rights in India, the Indian Express.
written by Christoph Jaffrelet, Sherik Lalawala, updated, December 12, 2019, 9 hours 47 minutes and 33 seconds am. Non-Muslims will now become refugees, whereas an ethno-religious criterion will guide the exclusion of the Muslim migrants from citizenship. Illustration, C.R. Sasakumar. The Citizenship Amendment Bill, CAB, has reopened a fundamental debate that lies at the heart of India's identity quest. Who is an Indian is a question that has been central to the task of nation-building since the Raj is the country, after the Muslim League asserted itself as representing the largest minority, was divided on the basis of religion in 1947. India's constitution makers discussed and debated the topic for almost two years. They ultimately chose a territorial definition of Indian citizenship, whoever was born in India was an Indian regardless of any other identity marker. This expansive definition stood in stark contrast with the idea of citizenship that Pakistan finally adopted, as the homeland of Muslims, this country could only have a Muslim head of state after the 1956 constitution was passed. Balabai Patel, India's first Deputy Prime Minister and Home Minister, commended the Constituent Assembly members for their inclusive idea of citizenship. He had reminded them of Mahatma Gandhi's struggle in South Africa against racial discrimination and had urged the members to not opt for an ethnicity-based notion of citizenship. This provision, to him and for many other members, was vital since it would be scrutinized all over the world. The Citizenship Act, 1955, which resulted from all these debates, now governs the citizenship law in India. Though this law has been amended multiple times, the first successful attempt to insert ethno-religious categorization of citizenship took place in early 2004 under the Vajpayee government. This amendment, simultaneous to the changes in citizenship rules, was passed in the face of growing unrest in Assam. While undocumented migrants were debarred from becoming citizens, this amendment allowed an exception for Pakistani Hindus from being considered illegal migrants, claiming that they were a persecuted community. India had begun to abandon the territorial idea of citizenship in favor of ethno religious notions. The current amendment to the Citizenship Act relies on the same idea. It intends to give shelter and protection to persecuted minorities by welcoming them as refugees and to grant them a fast track to citizenship by naturalization after a period of six years. But it is prepared to do it in a discriminatory manner, preparing the ground for a faith-based definition of citizenship. Indeed, the CAB would only apply to undocumented, Hindus, Sikhs, Jains, Buddhists, Christians, and Parsis from Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan. Such migrants would become refugees, whereas Muslims and members of other minorities, or atheists, would remain illegal. The Goy argues that Muslims cannot be oppressed in countries where Islam is an official religion, but Ahmadiyyas and Shias are in Pakistan, like Hazaras, also Shias, in Afghanistan. The CAB also ignores other neighboring countries, including Sri Lanka and Myanmar, where Tamils and Rohingya are at the receiving end of the state. These contradictions reflect the majoritarian dimension of this reform. After its inability to secure passage of the bill in early 2019 because of the opposition or abstention of a majority of MPs in the Rajya Sabha, the BJP reactivated the discourse on the citizenship amendments during the 2019 election campaign. BJP's president and now the country's home minister, Amit Shah, had termed the infiltrators as termites, in one of his election speeches and promised to throw them out of India while protecting refugees, if voted back to power. During the 2016 state elections in Assam, the BJP had already promised to clean this province of illegal migrants through the cab. On top of that, the government has pledged to bring an All India National Register of Citizens, NRC, to drive out the undocumented migrants, repeating the exercise recently completed in Assam. In the contentious final NRC draft of Assam, 19 lakh people were left out from Indian citizenship, at least one third of these people, according to estimates, are non Muslims. Hence, after the new citizenship law is passed, these non-Muslims will become refugees and Indian citizens after six years, whereas an ethno-religious criterion will guide the exclusion of the Muslim migrants from citizenship. These developments are bound to change the political demography of Assam, making the Hindu voters a clearer majority. 
A nationwide combination of the CAB and NRC will mark India as the natural habitat of Hindus while deriding some Muslims as foreigners. Indians will be called Indians not only on territorial grounds but also on ethno-racial and religious lines. This worldview is well in tune with the vision of V.D. Savarkar, the architect of the Hindutva ideology, who wrote, The Hindus are not merely the citizens of the Indian state because they are united not only by the bonds of the love they bear to a common motherland, but also by the bonds of a common blood. They are not only a nation but a race jati. However, Savarkar, interestingly, added, any convert of non-Hindu parentage to Hindutva can be a Hindu, if bona fide, he or she adopts our land as his or her country and marries a Hindu, thus coming to love our country as a real Pithrubhumi, fatherland, and adopts our culture and thus adores our land as the Punyabhumi, sacred land. In other words, for Savarkar, conversion to Hindutva, Sikh, was a way to become a citizen of India, but such a convert had to marry a Hindu too. This definition of the Indian identity has strong affinities with the ethno-nationalist ideologies of the European ideologues from whom the promoters of Hindutva drew their inspiration in the interwar period. M. S. Goldwalker, for instance, refers to many German theoreticians of the ethnic nation in his 1939 book, We, or Our Nationhood Defined. The CAB would not only change how the state views its citizens' rights but, it would also revise the conception of group rights in India. There has always been some tension between the liberal idea of individual rights and group-based rights in the Indian Republic. Until now, group rights have been used for emancipatory purposes to undo the historical wrongs, for instance, through quotas in public education and jobs for OBCs and Dalits. In that sense, the hierarchy of rights on class, caste or gender lines in India is meant for a gradualist, progressive social change. At other times, group differentiation has been used to respect diversity through special cultural rights of religious as well as linguistic minorities and tribals, and by redrawing the internal map of India on linguistic lines. The Modi government plans to radically reformulate the logic of community rights in India to exclude some Muslims from Indian citizenship. In turn, this new definition of group rights will worsen the socio-economic conditions of Muslims, who are already experiencing some decline. The questioning of the autonomy of India's only Muslim-majority state, Jammu and Kashmir, the Supreme Court's decision to give Babri Masjid land to build a Ram Mandir, and a nationwide NRC coupled with the proposed CAB would further change the character of the Indian Republic. India may no longer be a de facto Hindu Rashtra, but, to some extent, a de jure Hindu Rashtra with legally sanctioned religion-based exclusions effected without changing the constitution. It is now for the courts to decide whether some of these changes will stand the test of constitutionality or not. This article first appeared in the print edition on December 12, 2019 under the title, Redefining the Republic. The morning after cab, it will be a mistake to rely just on Supreme Court The Indian Express. Written by Pratap Banu Mehta, updated, December 12, 2019 10 hours 15 minutes and 56 seconds am. Protesters in a torchlight procession to protest against the Citizenship Amendment Bill Cab, in Gauhati, Assam, AP Photo, Anupam Nath. The Citizenship Amendment Bill uses a legal instrument to send an insidious political message, religious identity will play a dominant role in assessing claims to citizenship. Muslims will be increasingly marginalized from our conceptions of citizenship. No one denies that a country has a right to prioritize amongst different classes of refugees, based on a number of factors, risk assessment, availability of alternatives, historical ties, ground realities, humanitarian concerns, international obligations or even security concerns. But for a bill to, ex ante, name some communities and exclude others from consideration in this pathway to citizenship is a clever way of keeping the communal pot boiling under a legal imprimatur. The bill is not meant to solve any problem that could not have been solved through a less discriminatory process, it may even create more problems. But where does politics go, after cab? We look to the Supreme Court for a semblance of constitutional deliverance. We have no idea how a court will rule. But one of the lessons of our recent history is that we misunderstand how a Supreme Court functions in a democracy. 
The Supreme Court has badly let us down in recent times through a combination of avoidance, mendacity, and a lack of zeal on behalf of political liberty. We often explain this away as if this were the failing of individual judges. A particular judge might be compromised, are too scared to challenge the executive or they may simply be obtuse in their reasoning. In law as in politics, we carry on with the game, somewhere reassured that mistakes are idiosyncratic, and are possibly retrievable by the very processes that secured them. But what makes this constitutional moment pivotal is that there is, somewhere, a looming air of a retrievable finality about the changes that are being enshrined. But we should recognize that this direction is not going to be set through the nice formalisms of law, or the contrived conventions we can adhere to in normal times. The direction is going to be set by the mob, by brute power, by mobilization. Much ink will be spilled over whether the cab is unconstitutional or not. Learned minds will argue whether it passes the reasonable classification test, or whether it comports with constitutional morality. This argument is all to the good, and necessary within our protocols of adjudication. But we should be under no illusion that the final adjudication will not be a product of some self-evident normative idea, or some compelling logic within the law. As the joke goes, in law there is only one certainty, there is a case for and a case against. The final adjudication will be a product of what collectively citizens of India are able to convey about the kind of country they want to create. The point of the idea of constitutional morality is exactly that it does not provide any legal standard for adjudication. Rather, it points to the fact that the work of constitutionalism has to be done outside of the formal process of the law, in building up an ethos that tolerates differences, in shaping a sense of self that is moved by the demands of equality, or perturbed by the attacks on liberty. So constitutional morality is not a doctrine we can appeal to, to settle our differences. It is what we bring to adjudication, not what we get out of it. Similarly, the term, reasonable classification. The term, reasonable, is one of the most vexed terms in law and political theory. Arguments over it often have an air of circularity. Societies have often found discrimination, reasonable. When they cease to find it reasonable, it is often because larger social norms have changed, not because a court said so. If you took the cab in isolation, detached it from the political context, and its possibly catastrophic alignment with the NRC, the government could make the argument that its classification is not unreasonable, even if not everyone agrees with it. Even the original NRC debacle was created in part by the Supreme Court, presumably in its own mind acting on reasonable classifications. So while the legal and philosophical work is necessary, don't count on them to do our work for us. This is a truth that the BJP has realized. It moves the law, not by appealing to it but by changing the norms in politics and society that shape our imaginations of the law. It did this in the Ayodhya case literally by changing the facts on the ground, and demolishing the Babri Masjid, and altering our historical imaginations. So much so, that while the judges acknowledged that the demolition of the masjid was illegal, the fact that there was a structure there seemed to have no meaningful bearing on the final claims of who has possession. Similarly, whether the NRC was the right thing to do was shaped less by law than by a historical and sociological imagination of the problem in Assam or a sense of the capacities of the state. Similarly on Kashmir, the delay in hearing habeas corpus and other petitions was guided neither by logic, nor law. It was most likely guided by deference to what was perceived to be public sentiment, pure and simple. Given that so much constitutional adjudication mixes both normative what is the right thing to do, and statistical meaning, what is perceived public sentiment, the BJP has colonized the law by conveying a different sense of what public sentiment is. The lesson here is that we can rely on the courts, if at all, only if we do a lot of work outside the courts. If the public accepts the Home Minister's Orwellian statement that Kashmir is normal, don't be surprised if that definition of normalcy becomes a de facto standard that allows the court to postpone its day of reckoning in Kashmir. If our entire public discourse is pervaded by an exaggerated bogey of illegal immigration, don't expect the court to call the bluff on a discriminatory NRC. This is why it will be a mistake to rely just on the Supreme Court.
the political challenge is to make sure that one party's diabolical version of what is reasonable is not mistaken to be common sense. An exoneration, on clean chit to Modi, the Hindu. Commissions of inquiry are often seen as tools to manage public perception about lapses on the part of the state whenever an untoward incident takes place. Their reports are rarely submitted on time, many are not made public, and few stray from the clean chit route mapped out for them by the regimes that appointed them. Often, the findings are made public so late as to make little difference. The GT. Nanavati A.H. Meta Commission, constituted to probe the horrific burning of the Sabarmati Express train at Ghadra in 2002, and the deadly communal carnage that followed, fits this profile of a judicial commission to a T. Its exoneration of Narendra Modi, the then Chief Minister of Gujarat, should come as no surprise. Mr. Modi had already been absolved by a Supreme Court appointed special investigation team. A judicial magistrate had accepted the team's report. There were allegations that Mr. Modi had instructed the police to allow Hindus to vent their anger, and that he had placed two ministers in the police control room, but except for some oral testimony, there was no material evidence to back them. The Supreme Court did not accept the views of Amicus Curiae Raju Ramachandran that there was prima facie material to proceed against Mr. Modi for promoting enmity between different groups, and imputations prejudicial to national integration. Since then, Mr. Modi has led his party to victory in two general elections. The issue was never about direct involvement or instigation, but rather about culpable inaction, and his moral and political failure to take responsibility for the lawlessness that consumed the lives of over a thousand people and the mayhem unleashed by perceived supporters of the ruling party under his watch. It would have been unrealistic to expect that the probe would unearth any new evidence to establish a conspiracy at the highest level of the state government. However, what is somewhat disconcerting is that the panel says there was no orchestrated violence anywhere, and that no organization or party was involved. This flies in the face of convictions obtained in trial courts against political functionaries, including former BJP minister Maya Kadnani. Its only major finding on administrative failure pertains to Joint Commissioner of Police M.K. Tandon, under whose jurisdiction 177 people were killed in incidents at Gulbarg Society, Naroda Patia and Naroda Gam. He is indicted for failing to appreciate the gravity of the situation. Otherwise, the report sails with the official explanation that the riots were wholly spontaneous, and that the police did their best to contain it. It is disappointing, but not surprising, that the panel dismisses the testimony of three IPS officers on police complicity or inaction, as false, and questions the work of NGOs working for the victims. Or else blacklisting, the Indian Express. By, Editorial, New Delhi, updated, December 12, 2019, 11 hours 37 minutes and 58 seconds pm. It is important for India that the FATF stays the course with Pakistan because it is the only body that has had a demonstrable effect on the country's approach to terror groups based on its soil. The framing of charges against Hafiz Saeed by an anti-terrorism court in Lahore is the direct result of actions that the International Anti-Terror Watchdog, the Financial Action Task Force, has taken and further threatens to take against Pakistan if it does not crack down on terror. Pakistan is on the FATF grey list, and even if it is never moved to the blacklist, the possibility is dire. A blacklisting by the FATF, an organization de facto run by the U.S. Treasury Department, would be ruinous for Pakistan. This is why it is now seen to be taking action it previously dragged its feet on, acting against terrorist groups with an address in the country, including the head of the Lashkar-e-Toiba, Jamat ad dawa found responsible by that country's own investigators for planning and carrying out the 2008 Mumbai terrorist attacks. The Pakistan military has used these groups as a hedge in the region. 
Neither the impact of the Mumbai attack, nor the UN designation of Hafiz Saeed, could convince the Pakistan security establishment to treat him accordingly. Instead, his public stock was allowed to grow to a point where, last year, he could float a political party and field candidates in the general election. The farthest Pakistan went on Hafiz Saeed's terrorist record before being hit by the FATF was to put him under house arrest every now and then, until the courts freed him. Saeed's present troubles date back five months, to a time when the FATF was snapping at Pakistan's heels for compliance on its commitments made a year earlier. On July 3, Pakistan's counter-terrorism department booked Saeed and a dozen other leaders under terror financing and money laundering clauses of the Anti-Terrorism Act, ARTA, 1997. The JUD was accused of financing terrorism through several of its non-profit organizations and trusts, including al anfaral Trust, Darwich Ulirshad Trust and Muaz bin Jabal Trust. Saeed, now, has to appear at a trial that will be held every day. Significantly, Let also went quiet in the Kashmir Valley at about the same time. It is important for India that the FATF stays the course with Pakistan because it is the only body that has had a demonstrable effect on the country's approach to terror groups based on its soil. Saeed or the Let, Judd are not the only terrorist entities across the border that have India in the crosshairs. Eventually, the action Pakistan takes against these groups will be judged by the impact it has in the region. For all the latest opinion news download Indian Express app. Tags. Financial Action Task Force. Hafiz Saeed. Zero comments asterisk. Asterisk the moderation of comments is automated and not cleared manually by indianexpress.com. Should the creamy layer norm be extended to SC, STs? The Hindu reservation for Dalits is not to undo economic backwardness, but as remedy for untouchability. The center has called upon the Supreme Court to constitute a seven-judge bench to examine whether the creamy layer concept should be applied to scheduled castes, SCs, and scheduled tribes, STs, for promotions in service. In a conversation moderated by K. Venkataramanan, Sukade Othorat, former chairman, UGC, Professor Emeritus, the Center for Study of Regional Development in the School of Social Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University, and Ashwini Deshpande, Professor of Economics, Ashoka University, discuss the basis for reservation and the myths associated with it. Edited excerpts. Can you give us a perspective on the idea of applying the creamy layer concept to reservation and, in particular, to SCs and STs? Sakade Othorit, reservation in politics, services and institutions is given to SCs particularly because they were denied the right to property, education and industries for nearly 2,000 years. Besides they were treated as untouchables. Discrimination continues even today in society. The argument was that to provide them the safeguard, against discrimination, and compensate them to some extent for past exclusions, they should be given representation as per the population share. Because otherwise, due to persisting discrimination in services, enterprises and agriculture, they won't get the due share. They continue to be landless. I think there the policy should have been reparation or compensation. That has not been done. What we are doing is simply giving some protection against discrimination in the present, and giving a share in proportion to the population. So, instead of going to the Supreme Court, the government should have set up a committee and checked whether people in service face discrimination or not. And I have a feeling that there is a huge discrimination once you get into service. There are about 12,000 cases lying with the SC, same commission, complaining about discrimination in service. Therefore, they need protection in promotion also. Ashwini Deshpande, I agree that the reason for having reservation, at the entry level and then in promotions, is to combat discrimination, which can be economic or social. But reservation is not an anti-poverty program. The more advantageous sections of all caste groups are able to enter higher education. So, if we want to make sure that the poor are getting represented, we need a separate set of policies. 
we have to recognize that while both OBCs and SCs get reservation, the social reality under which Dalits live and the situation under which OBCs live are very different. So, I would make a case for justifying the creamy layer exclusion from within the OBCs, because for them a lot of it is economic backwardness. And if you are rich enough to cross a certain threshold, there isn't the kind of social discrimination that happens towards Dalits. In fact, there is an argument in the US that richer blacks face greater discrimination because the whites resent their entry into areas that are considered privileged for the whites. So, in a way, there is some evidence to show that discrimination actually increases with a rise in economic position. Even after Dalits get entry into jobs or higher education, there are little microaggressions that they face. For example, in educational institutions students complain of harassment because they came in through reservation. We need more data, but to link it with economic status is wrong. How far do you think the test of backwardness, the adequacy of representation, and the impact of reservations on the efficiency of administration affect or do not affect the prospects of SC, same candidates? Sakade Othorit, the reservation policy type of affirmative action is against discrimination, it is not based on economic consideration because the discrimination is independent of your economic standing. Women are asking for reservation. Have they ever raised the issue that relatively better off women should not get political reservation? Because they are discriminated based on gender, poor or non-poor. So, I think this clarity has to be there. I take the view that economic concessions should not be given. Don't give them subsidies, scholarships, because some of them are economically better off, but you cannot extend that argument to say that reservation should not be given to the economically better off. So, I think the Supreme Court has to understand the point academically, I don't think the issue is legal. Also read. Should SC, same creamy layers be given reservation? The Hindu Pali podcast. If there is a question of limit, the limit can be modified. If promotion harms others, there are other ways of helping them. The Supreme Court should not put a legal limit on it, 50% or otherwise. Find out the alternative ways of benefiting non-SCs, STs, while retaining reservation for SCs, STs. Ashwini Deshpande, one more point. If you treat the unfilled vacancies as a separate unit to be filled, you actually don't even exceed the 50%. In any case, the 50% limit is a bit arbitrary. It also has to be rethought. But even if you don't go into that today, the point is that if you consider the unfilled vacancies as a separate unit, and not club that with upcoming vacancies, it is possible to not violate that 50%. One more aspect is the test of backwardness. In Janail Singh, the court felt that the test of backwardness should not be made applicable at all to SC, STs. But at the same time it advocated the creamy layer concept to be applied. Isn't there some contradiction here? Sakade Othorit, yeah, I think there is a contradiction. On the one hand, they say that no criteria or indicator should be applied of backwardness to the SCs and STs. And on the other, they are trying to apply the same economic criteria to exclude some of the relatively economically better off SCs. And if at all the Supreme Court has to take a position, it should ask the government to set up a comprehensive committee to study the practice of untouchability and discrimination faced by SCs and STs. The court should revise its position, and see where they continue to face discrimination in all spheres of life. If a community does not face discrimination, then you can develop an anti-poverty policy for the poor. But when there is discrimination, you have a separate policy all over the world. Ashwini Deshpande, the point that both of us are repeating is that the reason for reservations for Dalits is not economic backwardness. It is the stigma that comes on account of the untouchable status. And even though legally untouchability has been abolished, there is a lot of data that show that people still practice untouchability. So the stigma that comes on account of an untouchable status. Reservation is only a tiny remedial measure for that. 
This continuous clubbing together of economic backwardness and stigma because of the untouchable status is wrong. Because you can talk about economic backwardness, but for Dalits you have to address the stigma. One argument was that while at the entry level a person is genuinely deprived, and reservation is a remedial measure, as he goes up the ladder in both income and status there may not be any need for reservation in promotions. And that the creamy concept should be applied at that level. Sukadeo thought it, we are emphasizing the point that the policy of reservation or affirmative action is based on discrimination, that is denial of equal opportunity which others enjoy. And the economically better off also face discrimination, in service and many other spheres. They also need a safeguard and that safeguard is the affirmative action policy. What I had also said is that since they are economically better off don't give them economic advantages like subsidies. They can afford that but you cannot extend this argument to say reservation should be withdrawn for the better off. There is need for reservation in promotions because they face discrimination in promotions. We don't have studies on this. The Supreme Court and government should undertake a study. Reservation is sort of peanuts. The public sector accounts for a small portion of jobs. And it is there they get some share. In private, they have no protection against discrimination. What you require is compensation for 2,000 years of repression. We have to give them land, funding to start industries, and for education. So, you require a large policy of compensation, reparation, supplemented by reservation. There is a provision in Article 335 on how affirmative action should be subject to overall efficiency. A division bench recently rejected the idea that reservation will have an impact on efficiency, but even then I think the view is still prevalent. Ashwini Deshpande, this belief that reservations affect the efficiency of public services is a complete myth. I have done a study with the Indian Railways. And that is the only long-term, big-scale study to actually empirically estimate the effect of reservations on efficiency. Reservations have no negative effect on efficiency. If anything, at the top level, they actually have a positive effect. Recently, another study came out looking at IAS offices' performance indicators, and that study reached the same conclusion. There is another study too. The point is that this myth is so strong that people are not willing to publicize the rigorous examination of this question. The courts insist on quantifiable data, whether it is on backwardness, on inadequacy of representation or the question of efficiency. Do you think it's too onerous a requirement for the government to demonstrate everything through quantifiable data? Ashwini Deshpande, I strongly support a data-based, evidence-based approach to judging reservations. We need to have greater transparency and data-based evidence to support any claims. Sakadeo Thorit, I would like to add that under the SC and Saint Prevention of Atrocities Act and the Protection of Civil Rights Act, it is the government's responsibility to undertake a study every five years, to bring out the nature of discrimination and untouchability faced by Dalits. The government's SC, Saint Commission report is supposed to have a separate chapter on untouchability. That report has not been brought out in the last 20 years or so. The government has also not done any study. There are quantitative techniques that will capture qualitative relationships but unfortunately such surveys have been bypassed by the NSSO. The reservation policy as it exists has been helpful and is a pro-poor policy. More than 60% of government employees are class 3 or class 4 employees and are poor and less educated. At the same time, there is massive privatization of public sector jobs and the public sector is increasingly taking on contractual jobs for which there is no reservation. There is a need to extend reservation to the private sector as well. Ashwini Deshpande, we need a strong anti-discrimination framework. There are so many barriers for the oppressed to approaching the justice system that it is difficult for somebody with genuine grievances about discrimination to seek justice. There is now a greater awareness about gender discrimination and institutions are making sure they develop structures to tackle it. 
We need similar structures for caste discrimination in the workplace. Ashwini Deshpande is Professor of Economics, Ashoka University, Sukade Othorat is former Chairman, UGC, and Professor Emeritus, Center for the Study of Regional Development, School of Social Sciences, JNU. In the name of a majority, the Hindu. The NRC in Assam has given us an indication of risks involved in such exercises of inclusion and exclusion. The Citizenship Amendment Bill CAB, passed in both houses this week, promises to give the protection of citizenship to non-Muslims who fled to India to escape religious persecution in Pakistan, Bangladesh and Afghanistan. While religious persecution is a reasonable ground for protection, the problem with the CAB is that it does not include all communities that suffered religious persecution, and explicitly excludes Muslims who suffered persecution in the specified countries and other non-Muslim majority countries like Myanmar. This majoritarian notion of religion-based citizenship, although intrinsic to the Bharatiya Janata Party BJP's idea of India, is not shared by the majority of people in this country. In addition, such a view is alien to the constitutional consensus which emerged in 1950, embodying the idea of a people who committed themselves, and those governing on the behalf, to a constitutional order. Those in support of the CAB have rallied around the argument that it is non-discriminatory and its objectives are justifiable. In doing so, they have often invoked the moral imperative of correcting a perceived past wrong, in this case the partition. In the process, the CAB changes completely the idea of equal and inclusive citizenship promised in the Constitution. Changes in citizenship law. The CAB cannot, however, be seen in isolation. It must be seen in tandem with the National Register of Citizens NRC, and other changes in the citizenship law, which have preceded it. The Home Minister and the Law Minister have clarified that the CAB and the NRC are distinct, the NRC protects the country against illegal migrants and the CAB protects refugees. This, however, is incommensurate with the election speeches made by BJP leaders. For instance, speaking in Kolkata earlier this year, Amit Shah had promised an NRC in West Bengal, but only after the passage of the CAB to ensure that no Hindu, Buddhist, Sikh, Jain and Christian refugee is denied citizenship for being an illegal immigrant. In a triumphal note after the passage of the CAB in Lok Sabha, Mr. Shah declared that a nationwide NRC would follow soon. Despite the seemingly disparate and adversarial political imperatives, the CAB and the NRC have become conjoined in their articulation of citizenship. Indeed, the two represent the tendency towards due sanguinous in the citizenship law in India, which commenced in 1986, became definitive in 2003, and has reached its culmination in the contemporary moment. In 2003, the insertion of the category, illegal migrants, in the provision of citizenship by birth became the hinge from which the NRC and the CAB later emerged. The Citizenship, Registration of Citizens and Issue of National Identity Cards, rules of 2003 made the registration of all citizens of India, issue of national identity cards, the maintenance of a national population register, and the establishment of an NRC by the central government compulsory. Under these rules, the Registrar-General of Citizen Registration is to collect particulars of individuals and families, including the citizenship status, through a house-to-house -house enumeration. In an exception to the general rule, Assam has followed a different procedure of inviting applications with particulars of each family and individual and the citizenship status based on the NRC 1951 and electoral rolls up to the midnight of March 24, 1971. The purpose of the NRC is to sift out foreigners and illegal migrants who were referred to at different points as infiltrators and aggressors and a threat to the territory and people of India. Exempting minority groups. The second strand emerging from the 2003 amendment has taken the form of the CAB, which exempts minority communities, Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, and Christians, from three countries, Bangladesh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, from the category of illegal migrants. 
The CAB brings the citizenship law in line with exemptions already made in the Passport Act 1920 and Foreigners Act 1946 through executive orders in September 2015 and July 2016. It sets a cut-off date of December 31, 2014 as the date of eligibility of illegal migrants for exemption. It must be noted that appeal filed by the Assam Sanmilita Mahasanga pending before the Supreme Court has contested the deviation in the cut-off date set for Assam by the Citizenship Amendment Act 1986, March 24, 1971, from the date specified in Article 6 of the Constitution, i.e., July 19, 1948, which applies to the rest of the country. The CAB is applicable to entire India, and takes the cut-off date forward by several years. The claim that the CAB does not violate the constitution is reflective of the recommendations of the Joint Parliamentary Committee JPC. The JPC was advised by constitutional experts to use a broader category, persecuted minorities, to protect the bill from the charge of violating the right to equality in Article 14. The CAB uses the category, minority communities, and goes on to identify them on the ground of religion. The notifications of September 2015 and July 2016, which changed the Passport and Foreigners Acts, had mentioned the term, religious persecution. The consideration of religious persecution for making a distinction among persons, the JPC argued, could not be discriminatory, because the distinction was both intelligible and reasonable, satisfying the standards laid down in the Supreme Court judgment in State of West Bengal v. Anwar Ali Sarkarbib, 1952, to affirm adherence to Article 14. Test of Reasonableness the JPC appears, however, to have overlooked the substantive conditions that the Supreme Court laid down in the same verdict. These require that the criteria of intelligibility of the differentia and the reasonableness of classification, must satisfy both grounds of protection guaranteed by Article 14, i.e., protection against discrimination and protection against the arbitrary exercise of state power. In 2009, the Delhi High Court judgment in NAS Foundation v. Government of NCT of Delhi referred to, a catena of decisions to lay down a further test of reasonableness, requiring that the objective for such classification in any law must also be subjected to judicial scrutiny. The restraint on state arbitrariness, according to the judgment, was to come from constitutional morality, which as B.R. Amtka declared in the Constituent Assembly, was the responsibility of the state to protect. It remains a puzzle as to why the government wishes to change the citizenship law to address the problem of refugees. The JPC refers to standard operating procedures for addressing the concerns of refugees from neighboring countries. In the case of refugees from the erstwhile West Pakistan who deposed before the JPC in favor of a cab, the standard operating procedure was the grant of long-term visas leading to citizenship. One wonders how these refugees will benefit from a law which will put them through an arduous process of proving religious persecution. Immediately after partition, displaced persons constituted an administrative category, and citizenship files of 1950s tell us how district officials expedited the citizenship in the process of preparation of electoral rolls. The focus in the recent parliamentary debates, for various reasons, was the eastern borders. States in the region have resisted the cab, and simultaneously asked for an NRC. West Bengal has been an exception. The reality of imposing a national order of things, through a CAB and an NRC, in non-national spaces will unfold in future but Assam has given us adequate evidence of the risks involved. It can only be hoped that the judiciary and civil society are able to restore constitutional and democratic politics through an exercise of counter-majoritarian power in a context where electoral gains have determined political choices. Anu Palmer Roy teaches at the Center for Political Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Nation number 194, on Bougainville, the Hindu.
With Bougainville's overwhelming vote for independence from Papua New Guinea PNG, the country has crossed a milestone in the peace process following the civil war that ended in 1998. The non-binding referendum, to ascertain a preference for either greater autonomy or separate statehood, was a promise enshrined in the 2001 Bougainville Peace Agreement. In a province of fewer than 3, 000, 000, the voting process spanning two weeks underscored the challenges facing the regional administration in Buka and that in the national capital of Port Moresby. The Bougainville Referendum Commission undertook the commendable task of enlisting inmates in hospitals and prisons and non-residents to ensure that the conduct of the franchise was inclusive. A testament of the participation was the 85% turnout in the plebiscite. With 98% opting to secede, the people spoke emphatically at the end of an animated campaign. The demand for separate statehood in Bougainville dates back almost to PNG's independence in 1975. This sentiment was further crystallized by the conflict over the open-cast copper mine in Panguna Town, among the world's largest and richest, whose revenues accounted for over 45% of the country's export earnings. In the confrontation that centered around sharing the mineral resources, the Bougainville Revolutionary Army was pitted against the PNG security forces for a decade. An estimated 20,000 lives were lost and many were displaced. Enforcing the Bougainville verdict is bound to be protracted, characteristic of the political and administrative processes of carving out the boundaries of a new state. Foremost, in an attempt to give shape to the decision, Port Moresby and Buka will engage in negotiations. Any agreement would have to be ratified by the country's parliament. Significantly, the central government had hoped that the region would vote to remain rather than secede, whereas among Bougainvillians and observers, the choice for separation was a foregone conclusion. In a sign of the future shape of events, the PNG minister responsible for Bougainville recently expressed concern that Buka could set a precedent for any other breakaway movement. There are, moreover, issues around the economic viability of the tiny island group. The controversy over the Panguna mine still lingers, as the company that once controlled operations is vying for restoration of its license. The Bougainville government, which last year clamped an indefinite moratorium on the mine's reopening, would inevitably have to revisit that decision sooner rather than later. But the advent of the world's 194th nation may be some distance in the future. An exoneration, on clean shit to Modi, the Hindu. Commissions of inquiry are often seen as tools to manage public perception about lapses on the part of the state whenever an untoward incident takes place. Their reports are rarely submitted on time, many are not made public, and few stray from the clean chit route mapped out for them by the regimes that appointed them. Often, the findings are made public so late as to make little difference. The GT. Nanavati A.H. Mater Commission, constituted to probe the horrific burning of the Sabarmati Express train at Godra in 2002, and the deadly communal carnage that followed, fits this profile of a judicial commission to a T. Its exoneration of Narendra Modi, the then Chief Minister of Gujarat, should come as no surprise. Mr. Modi had already been absolved by a Supreme Court-appointed special investigation team. A judicial magistrate had accepted the team's report. There were allegations that Mr. Modi had instructed the police to allow Hindus to vent their anger, and that he had placed two ministers in the police control room. But except for some oral testimony, there was no material evidence to back them. The Supreme Court did not accept the views of Amicus Curie Rayu Ramachandran that there was prima facie material to proceed against Mr. Modi for promoting enmity between different groups and imputations prejudicial to national integration. Since then, Mr. Modi has led his party to victory in two general elections. The issue was never about direct involvement or instigation, but rather about culpable inaction, and his moral and political failure to take responsibility for the lawlessness that consumed the lives of over a thousand people and the mayhem unleashed by perceived supporters of the ruling party under his watch.
It would have been unrealistic to expect that the probe would unearth any new evidence to establish a conspiracy at the highest level of the state government. However, what is somewhat disconcerting is that the panel says there was no orchestrated violence anywhere, and that no organization or party was involved. This flies in the face of convictions obtained in trial courts against political functionaries, including former BJP minister Maya Kodnani. Its only major finding on administrative failure pertains to Joint Commissioner of Police M.K. Tandon, under whose jurisdiction 177 people were killed in incidents at Gulbarg Society, Naroda Patia and Naroda Gam. He is indicted for failing to appreciate the gravity of the situation. Otherwise, the report sails with the official explanation that the riots were wholly spontaneous, and that the police did the best to contain it. It is disappointing, but not surprising, that the panel dismisses the testimony of three IPS officers on police complicity or inaction, as false, and questions the work of NGOs working for the victims. An Encounter with Injustice, The Indian Express Written by Mirin Chada Borwanka, updated, December 12, 2019, 11 hours 51 minutes and 31 seconds p.m. This joyous reception of an encounter and the police officers involved only proves that people have lost faith in India's criminal justice system. Image for representational purpose only. The country is engaged in an intense debate on the heinous rapes and murders, the blatant use of force by criminals on bail and the sheer impunity with which they gangrape and then burn women. Shot at if they are too tired to dance and murdered if they want to live on the terms. One would have thought that the changes in the law and procedure post the December 2012 Delhi gangrape and murder case would curb the predators, but they do not seem to have any effect on them. So shaken has the country been that rose petals were showered on the officers of the Telangana police that encountered the four alleged rapists of a doctor on the outskirts of Hyderabad. This has given rise to another debate about the actions of the police. While the woman on the street is happy that the brutal rape has been avenged and the parents of the deceased doctor and of the Delhi 2012 victim have expressed relief at the quick police operation, we must understand the full implications of the law of instant justice. The clamor for quick action, teaching a lesson, on the spot justice, stems from the fact that the criminal justice system has failed in the country. One main reason is the delay in trials. Even if a criminal is convicted, the appeals that follow lead to a further delay of more than five years. This has meant that citizens lose faith in the law and they hero worship officers who encounter these criminals. They cite examples of the Delhi 2012 accused still in Tihar and Ajmal Kassab, who was hanged six years after the gruesome killing of innocent citizens in Mumbai. One taxi driver, while justifying the Telangana police person's action, questioned me as to why we spent so much money on Kassab's security. He also informed me that Kassab was served Matai in prison every day. He had no clue that I was chief of Maharashtra prisons at the time in question. This shows how rumors and misinformation further angers citizens who are already enraged at the late punishment to criminals and I understand their anguish. Last week, I received a summons from a special court in Mumbai seeking my presence at the trial of a criminal case. I had supervised its investigation as Joint Commissioner Crime, Mumbai, in 2005. The case is still pending. The investigating officer informed me that he was now posted at a training institute and was not aware at what stage the trial was at nor was he aware that I had been summoned by the court. This is what is happening in most of the trials. They are so delayed that witnesses lose interest or do not attend hearings. Documents are lost, seized weapons are not traceable. The investigating offices get transferred and thus can not monitor trials. The complainant, after pursuing the case for some time, gives up. There is a collective sense of resignation in the country. In this depressing scenario, we have a few shootouts by police, which are applauded because otherwise, nothing seems to be happening on the ground. 
This joyous reception of an encounter and the police officers involved only proves that people have lost faith in India's criminal justice system. It also shows that the malady runs deep and recovery is so distant that shortcuts have become the preferred mode of execution. Instead of succumbing to the band-aids, we have to use all our resources and energy in putting the system back on track. While police investigation and presentation by the prosecutors need to improve, it is the judiciary that must rise to the occasion. Session courts need to finish cases at one go, within a week or fortnight, and not hear them in the piecemeal manner they are doing currently. They need to clamp down heavily on adjournments. Similarly, higher courts must dispose of appeals within a fixed time frame. Expenses for more judicial offices and the staff should be met by the centre and state governments jointly. If a rape accused is sentenced and his final appeal disposed of within a year, I see no scope for encounters or the public's agitation. It is because justice has become a rarity and criminals on bail are burning girls after raping them that citizens have lost the patience. For police, medical officers, forensic experts, prosecutors and judicial officers to work together as a team, it is essential that formal interactive sessions between them are organized. Regular training workshops will lead to an exchange of information, knowledge sharing and mutual trust among different wings of the criminal justice system. Today, each works in a silo with hardly any collaboration. The result is a very poor conviction rate that may not attract the immediate attention of citizens but reinforces a general feeling of lawlessness. While the emotional response of a parent who has lost her daughter to rapists is totally understandable, as a nation, we have to invest in long-term solutions. That means investing in all four wings of the crumbling criminal justice system, police prosecution, judiciary and prisons. That we are not doing so is amply proved by the need for officers to take up guns for causes they feel will not get justice. It is a sad commentary that we have acknowledged and, in fact, applauded that we are a banana republic. India, after more than 70 years of independence, needs to be the lighthouse for the rule of law. Let's make that happen together. The writer, an IPS officer, retired as DG, Bureau of Police Research and Development. For all the latest opinion news download Indian Express app. More from Miran Chada Borwanka. Due process, the imperative to follow it, was missing in the Tiz Hazari incident. Why has an inquiry been ordered against the police? Why is the inquiry not about the incident? I am seething with anger at an unjust. It's time officers renewed the commitment to the nation, not the government of the day. To the common man, the civil services represent a very important tool to establish an equitable society through which he hopes to better his life. Indian civil services run the risk of producing just clones who seek precedence not innovation in work. What the civil services need is a culture that accepts and values questioning and the irreverence of bold offices, the ultimate objective, of course, is tags. December 16, Delhi Gangrape. Telangana Police. Zero comments asterisk. Asterisk the moderation of comments is automated and not cleared manually by IndianExpress.com. A constitutional obligation, the Indian Express. Written by Hitesh Jain, updated, December 13, 2019, 2 hours 39 minutes and 45 seconds am. Many doubts have been cast on the legality of the bill. However, the bill conforms to India's constitutional spirit. Illustration by The joyous birth of the Indian nation-state is coterminous with the horrors of partition in 1947. A natural consequence thereof was the influx of migrants due to the two-nation theory employed by West and East Pakistan. Many Indian states came to be affected by the process of immigration which challenged the demographic dimensions of the states as influx did not cease even after partition. Conversely, many minorities found themselves at the mercy of nations which followed a state religion. At the time, the population of both Pakistan and Bangladesh comprised several non-Muslims. 
However, as opposed to India which is a secular nation, both Pakistan and Bangladesh are Islamic states. Being historically and geographically interlinked with both ancestral and spiritual ties, it falls as nothing short of an obligation for the Indian nation-state to provide refuge to non-Muslim minorities who have been persecuted for their otherness in these countries over the past six decades. This obligation is constitutional in nature and its genesis can be found in the Constituent Assembly debates. During the debate that took place on Articles 5 and 6 on August 10, 1949, in the Constituent Assembly, B. R. Ambedkar, the chairman of the drafting committee of the Constitution of India, had expressed hardship in drafting Article 5. This article refers to, citizenship not in any general sense but to citizenship on the date of commencement of this constitution. It is not the object of this particular article to lay down a permanent law of citizenship for the country. The business of laying down a permanent law of citizenship has been left to Parliament, and as members will see from the wording of Article 6 present day Article 11, as I have moved, the entire matter regarding citizenship has been left to Parliament to determine by any law it may deem fit. He further stated, it is not possible to cover every kind of case for a limited purpose, namely, the purpose of conferring citizenship on the date of commencement of the Constitution. If there is any category of people who are left out by the provisions contained in this amendment, we have given power to Parliament subsequently to make provision for them. In accordance with this constitutional obligation, the Union Government tabled the Citizenship Amendment Bill 2019 in Parliament. The bill seeks to insert a new provision in Section 2, 1, b, dealing with definition of illegal migrant of the Citizenship Act 1955, where the bill states, provided that any person belonging to Hindu, Sikh, Buddhist, Jain, Parsi or Christian community from Afghanistan, Bangladesh or Pakistan, who entered India on or before the 31st day of December, 2014 and who has been exempted by the central government by or under Clause C of Subsection 2, of Section 3 of the Passport, Entry into India, Act, 1920 or from the application of the provisions of the Foreigners Act. 1946 or any rule or order made thereunder, shall not be treated as a legal migrant for the purpose of this Act. Other salient features of the bill include the exemption granted to a large part of the Northeast region from applicability of the proposed law, except Manipur, cut-off dates for entry into India and a clause related to overseas citizen of India. The bill is a manifestation of a constitutional promise made to those who have suffered in the aftermath of partition and its consequences. Many doubts have been cast on the legality of the bill. However, the bill does conform to India's constitutional spirit. Here's how. Parliament's power to enact the bill. An examination of the text of Article 11 of the Indian Constitution reveals that Parliament is empowered to make any law relating to the acquisition or termination of citizenship and all other matters relating to citizenship. Further, it was the intent of the framers of the Constitution for Parliament to have the power to include those who, at the time of the Constitution coming into existence, were not included within the fold of the citizenship laws. It is therefore well within the rights of Parliament to enact this bill and it stands the test of procedural due process. Presumption of legality. A basic rule of interpretation is always presumption in favor of the constitutionality of a statute. The burden is upon him who attacks it to show that there has been a clear transgression of constitutional principles. The presumption may be rebutted in certain cases by showing that on the fact of the statute, there is no classification and no difference peculiar to any individual or class, and not applicable to any other individual or class, and yet, the law hits only a particular individual or class. It ought to be assumed that the legislature correctly understands and appreciates the needs of its own people, that its law are directed to problems made manifest by experience, and, that its discrimination is based on adequate grounds. In order to sustain the presumption of constitutionality, the court may take into consideration matters of common knowledge, matters of report, the history of the times, and such facts which may exist at the time of the legislation.
Thus, the legislation is free to recognize degrees of harm and may confine its restriction to those cases where the need is deemed to be the clearest. While good faith and knowledge of the existing conditions on the part of a legislature are to be presumed, if there is nothing on the face of the law or the surrounding circumstances that is brought to the notice of the court, upon which the classification may reasonably be regarded as based, the presumption of constitutionality cannot be carried to an extent that there must be some undisclosed and unknown reason for subjecting certain individuals or corporation to be hostile or discriminating legislation. The bill fulfills the challenge posed by Article 14 of the Indian Constitution. At the outset, Article 14 states that, the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of the laws within the territory of India prohibition of discrimination on grounds of religion, race, caste, sex or place of birth. Article 14 has both a positive and a negative aspect. It provides for equal protection of the law in its positive aspect. In the negative aspect of equality before law, what necessarily follows is that those in unequal positions ought not to be treated equally. In the case of Ram Krishna Dalmia v. Justice S. R. Tendulkar, the true meaning and scope of Article 14 was reiterated as follows, it is now well established that while Article 14 forbids class legislation, it does not forbid reasonable classification for the purposes of legislation. In order, however, to pass the test of permissible classification, two conditions must be fulfilled i. That the classification must be founded on an intelligible differentia which distinguishes persons or things that are grouped together from others left out of the group, and e. That that differentia must have a rational relation to the object sought to be achieved by the statute in question. The classification may be founded on different bases, namely, geographical, or according to objects or occupations or the like. What is necessary is that there must be a nexus between the basis of classification and the object of the act under consideration. It is also well established by the decision of this court that Article 14 condemns discrimination not only by a substantive law but also by a law of procedure. The exception to Article 14 is broadly the test of reasonable classification and intelligible differentia. The bill stands the test of reasonable classification as propounded by the seven-judge bench of the humble Supreme Court of India in the case of State of West Bengal v. Anwar Ali Sarkar. In this case, the humble apex court stated that intelligible differentia means there ought to be a yardstick to differentiate between those included and those excluded from a group. In the case of Navche Singh Johar v. Union of India, Humble Justice Indu Malhotra further propounded the test of intelligible differentia, to mean, reasonable differentia. This means that even the yardstick for inclusion or exclusion ought to be reasonable in itself. Further, Justice Malhotra states that no legislation can differentiate on the basis of a trait intrinsic to a person. The classification adopted in the bill, is clear and substantial, and there are sufficient reasons for making the distinction. In the case of Parisons Agrotech p. Limited v. Union of India, the Apex Court held that once sufficient material is found for taking a particular policy decision, bringing it within the four corners of Article 14 of the Constitution, power of judicial review would not extend to determine the correctness of such a policy decision or to indulge into the exercise of finding out whether there could be more appropriate alternatives. It was held that, the Equality Clause does not forbid geographical classification, provided the difference between the geographical units has a reasonable relation to the object sought to be achieved. It is therefore pertinent to note that the legislature is within its rights to enact the bill. Merely because there is a distinction does not prima facie constitute a challenge to Article 14 of the Constitution. Even the JPC for the bill had invited all stakeholders, interested parties to make its representations. The government also dealt with the reason as to the exclusion of other neighbouring countries like Sri Lanka and Myanmar as follows, Government of India has issued a standard operating procedure, SOP, v. letter dated 29 December 2011 for dealing with foreign nationals in India who claim to be refugees. 
These guidelines are applicable to refugees from various countries including Sri Lanka, Myanmar etc. The courts allow permissible classification, which includes selective application of a law according to the exigencies where it is sanctioned. The provisions of the bill appear to have made a classification based on the fact of minority communities being persecuted in the specified countries on the basis of their religion and leaving the country without valid travel documents. By introducing this bill the Indian state is enforcing a positive discrimination which is necessary, expedient and legally and constitutionally permissible. The writer is a senior lawyer based in Mumbai, managing partner at Paranam Law Associates and director, Bluecraft Digital Foundation. For all the latest opinion news download Indian Express app. More from Hitesh Jain. Unlike the emergency, Article 370 was abrogated to undo an historic wrong. Comparing the abrogation to draconian acts such as Misa and the proclamation is a mismatch of epic proportions. It is to be noted that Article Congress and the judicial coke hold. When cases go against it, the party tends to try and leverage unfair advantage in judiciary. Tags. Citizenship Amendment Bill. Zero comments asterisk. Asterisk the moderation of comments is automated and not cleared manually by IndianExpress.com. Who is a citizen? The Indian Express. Written by Manash Firak Bhattacharji. Updated, December 13, 2019, 6 hours 5 minutes and 47 seconds am. The Citizenship Amendment Bill is being opposed across the Northeast while in Assam, groups see it as a threat to the indigenous communities of the region. File. The Citizenship Amendment Bill, CAB, was passed in the Lok Sabha on December 9 and in the Raja Sabha December 11. It introduces special provisions for Hindus, Christians, Sikhs, Parsis, Jains and Buddhists fleeing persecution in Pakistan, Afghanistan and Bangladesh. Amending the Citizenship Act of 1955, the CAB makes partial gestures of inclusivity, but within an exclusionary framework. The idea of citizenship has been broadened to include persecuted migrants seeking asylum. But the criterion includes minorities only from Muslim-majority countries, and persecuted Muslims have been kept out. By excluding Muslim refugees from the CAB, and including everyone except Muslim immigrants in the proposed National Register for Citizenship NRC, the government has closed the doors to India's largest minority from both sides. The U.S. Commission for International Religious Freedom issued a statement that the CAB runs counter to India's rich history of secular pluralism and the Indian Constitution, which guarantees equality before the law regardless of faith. The statement is a good reminder of how India is losing the promise of inclusivity. In response to Algu Rai Shastri's question in the Constituent Assembly debates on January 8, 1949, who sought clarity on, who is a citizen of India and who is not, Jawaharlal Nehru, responded, so far as the refugees are concerned, we accept as citizens anybody who calls himself a citizen of India. He based the idea of asylum on a combination of free will with effectivity. The decision to belong comes from the feeling to belong, and both deserve to be respected. This is perhaps the widest possible humanist consideration behind defining the citizen. During the debates, on August 12, 1949, Mabu Bali Baig from Madras pondered why should any Indian he did not specify religion, wanting to migrate from Pakistan, on account of civil disturbances be put under question. Baig reminded the House that during the transfer of power, there was an agreement by both parties to protect and safeguard minorities. But, after the transfer, Baig said, there was a holocaust. There were tragedies which compelled persons to migrate. Arguing against the logic of suspicion, Baig stated, to say those people coming to India might become traitors and therefore, they should not be allowed to come back, that is no reason at all. With this temperament you will never become strong. Any nation based on paranoia cannot be strong. Baig argued that people migrate out of circumstances, where the mind is full of fear and doesn't work freely, or with clarity. 
It does not warrant any discrimination against those people based on their identity. There is no reason to deny them asylum. Nehru voiced a similar opinion, regarding, nationalist Muslims, who were driven out by circumstances and who having gone to the other side saw that they had no place there at all. Considered, opponents and enemies, when their lives were made miserable in Pakistan, these Muslims expressed a desire to return, and some did. Pakistan considered these Muslims its enemy not based on religion, but nationality, even ethnicity. Be it religion or nation, suspicion is a territorial sentiment. Trust must die, for the enemy to be born. In Nehru's account, the sentiment of warmth cancels suspicion. He also draws a tacit distinction between the circumstantial and the filial, those who return home can reclaim the belonging. Tabling the bill in the Lok Sabha, Amit Shah said, the citizenship amendment bill wouldn't have been needed if the Congress had not allowed partition on basis of religion. The logic of partition is enhanced, not cured, by blaming the tragic event to justify a new law of segregation. It is a contradictory and self-serving logic, seeking to restore communal divisions by accusing others of it. Bihar's Brajeshwar Prasad made the point during the debates that, the mischief of partition should not be allowed to spread beyond the legal fact of partition. The communal politics of partition, Prasad felt, must end after independence. But it was inevitable that the logic, or the law, of that politics would linger. Partition is not just a legal, but a historical fact, and it was survived by the politics that created it. On the question of migration, Prasad raised the interesting argument that everyone under the colonial territory deserved to find asylum in India. It was an anti-colonial idea of citizenship. He said, if people who have always lived in the Punjab and on the frontier have come and become citizens of this state, why cannot a Mohammedan of the frontier be so when we have always said that we are one? In contrast, Amit Shah said in the Raja Sabha, the government was interested in persecuted non-Muslims from the three Islamic states alone. He scoffed at the opposition for limiting its secularism to Muslims. The obverse logic is chilling, to consider the rights of Muslims is no longer necessary for secularism. BJP leaders have consistently blamed Nehruvian secularism for being a politics of appeasement. Provoked by this accusation, Nehru had said during the debates, do the honorable members who talk of appeasement think that some kind of rule should be applied when dealing with these people which has nothing to do with justice or equity. The bogey of appeasement diverts attention from what minorities deserve. Nehru also defended the secular state by objecting to the impression that it is something, amazingly generous, given something out of our pocket. The argument in favor of the secular state was never to imply something extraordinary. It was meant to cure people's historical prejudices, and keep a nation-state from relapsing into majoritarianism. Both these possibilities have today regained their hold on the polity and the social sphere. We are poised to lose, not find, the ethical understanding of who ought to be a citizen of India. Bhattacharji is author of Looking for the Nation, Towards Another Idea of India. For all the latest opinion news download Indian Express app. Tags. Citizenship Amendment Bill. Indian Citizenship. Zero comments asterisk. Asterisk the moderation of comments is automated and not cleared manually by IndianExpress.com. Regions Edged the Indian Express. By Editorial, New Delhi, updated, December 12, 2019, 11 hours 38 minutes and 20 seconds p.m. The onus is now on the Modi government to reach out to the restive groups and take the necessary steps to address and alleviate their fears. The Northeast, particularly Assam, has reacted with agitation to the passage through Parliament of the Citizenship Amendment Bill, which makes illegal migrants who are Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, Parsis and Christians from Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan eligible for citizenship. The fear that the cab will result in an influx of migrants from across the borders and alter the demography of Assam has provoked people to take to the streets. Many have defied the curfew to burn vehicles and target public buildings. 
Transport links to the region, and within it, have been disrupted and the government has shut down the internet. This situation threatens to undo the gains of the relative peace that the region has enjoyed in the past two decades. It could destabilize New Delhi's Act East policy. Political players in the region and at the center must urgently come together and work to allay public fears and ensure calm. The CAB, and the National Register of Citizens process before it, have stoked tensions that had flared in the region, especially in Assam, in the 1970s and 80s. The fear of demographic change has been the trigger for subnationalist movements, including the Assam agitation, in the 1970s, as well as the insurgencies in Nagaland, Manipur, Mizoram, Tripura and Meghalaya. It stemmed from the colonial-era settlement policies for exploitation of the region's resources and was sharpened by the fallout of partition, which the region experienced twice, in 1947 and 1971, which saw an unsettling of populations, particularly in parts of Assam and Tripura. But these scars had started to heal over time, and a tenuous peace had set in. The NRC, which the BJP aggressively promoted in Assam, and now threatens to extend nationwide, along with the CAB, have revived these fault lines. If the NRC process revived the outsider debate, the CAB pits Assamese against Bengali. Exemptions related to the Inner Line Permit, ILP, to allay the fears of Nagaland, Mizoram, Manipur, Arunachal Pradesh and Meghalaya, and the Schedule 6 areas, may have temporarily helped to avert a consolidated opposition to the CAB in the region. However, fears have been exacerbated in the Brahmaputra and Barak valleys in Assam and Tripura that these places will have to bear the weight of the probable inward migration of Hindus from Bangladesh. The onus is now on the Modi government to reach out to the restive groups and take the necessary steps to address and alleviate their fears. Electoral exigencies and ideological shibboleths cannot be the decisive factors in shaping the policy for the Northeast. Its repercussions will reflect in India's relations with its neighbors apart from shaping domestic politics. For all the latest opinion news download Indian Express app. Tags. Assam. Citizenship Amendment Bill. Zero comments asterisk. Asterisk the moderation of comments is automated and not cleared manually by IndianExpress.com. A boy called Yusuf, the Indian Express. By, Editorial, New Delhi, updated, December 12, 2019, 11 hours 43 minutes and 6 seconds p.m. On December 11, as Parliament redrew the boundaries of what defined an Indian, Dilip Kumar turned 97. Once upon a time, a boy born in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, Peshawar, and raised in Nashik, Maharashtra, ran away from home, and eventually found work at Bombay Talkies for his proficiency in Urdu. On the advice of owner, Deva Karani, he adopted what was seen to be a more acceptable name, and went on to become one of Bollywood's biggest stars. He would act as Devdas, the eternal romantic, Salim, the rebellious prince, Ganga, the dacoit, and Shankar, the Tongawala, giving Bollywood a new, more intense language. He would hold on to his mother tongue, the dying Hindko dialect of Peshawar, while learning to speak fluently in Urdu, Hindi, Bhojpuri, English, Punjabi, Marathi, Bengali, Gujarati, Pashto, Farsi, and Tamil. On December 11, as Parliament redrew the boundaries of what defined an Indian, he turned 97. Pressed to put his identity down on paper in the post-citizenship amendment, Bill India, the man who drew on words and poetry to sustain his art, drawing inspiration from both sides of the border, would struggle. Should he list himself as a Muslim, the religion he was born into, or a Hindu, the religion whose tag he embraced so easily? Under, home, should he list Peshawar's Kisa Kwani Bazaar, the market of the storytellers, which, to his regret, he couldn't visit in 1997, when he had received Pakistan's highest honor, due to uncontrollable crowds. But, how could it not be Mumbai, the city from whose stories he remains inseparable? 
Whether he saw the proceedings in Parliament on Wednesday or not, where one side used Jinnah to defend the bill and the other side invoked Hitler to denounce it, he could have lent the debate the weight of nearly a century's history, strewn with names of big kings who fell and small heroes who rose. To those who come bearing the questions, Tragedy King, Yusuf Khan alias Dilip Kumar would have stories from closer home with happy endings, about Prithviraj Kapoor from Peshawar who also made Mumbai his, and about another Khan from Peshawar, in another time, who also became the Badshah of Bollywood. For all the latest opinion news download Indian Express app. Tags. Citizenship Amendment Bill. Dilip Kumar. Zero comments asterisk. Asterisk the moderation of comments is automated and not cleared manually by indianexpress.com. The Day of Boris, on UK. Polls, the Hindu. The decisive victory the Conservative Party clinched in Thursday's elections to Parliament gives British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who built his campaign around the promise to get Brexit done, a clear mandate to take the UK out of the European Union without further delay. Initial results show that his party is set to win 364 seats in the 650-member House of Commons, the greatest performance of the Conservatives in over three decades. The Labour, led by veteran socialist Jeremy Corbyn, is expected to win 203 seats, its worst performance in decades. It is Mr Johnson's victory. He is the one who called for an early election after reaching a new divorce deal with the EU. He turned the poll into a de facto Brexit referendum, arguing that only a stable Conservative government could take the UK out of the EU quickly and end the lingering political standoff. His strategy was to consolidate the pro-Brexit vote, get a fresh mandate in Parliament and then quicken the divorce process. The Labour Party, on the other side, has been ambivalent on the question of Brexit. Mr Corbyn promised another referendum and declined to state what his position would be during that vote. His focus was on the economy. He promised a radical expansion of the state with plans to tax the rich, increase public spending and nationalize utilities. The Labour leader may have hoped that his radical economic agenda would cut through the Brexit narrative. But it did not. In the end, Labour fought a Brexit election without articulating a clear position on Brexit. Unsurprisingly, it lost even its traditional working-class districts in the Midlands and north of England that had overwhelmingly voted to leave in the 2016 referendum. Mr Johnson is now confident that he could push his withdrawal agreement through Parliament at the earliest so that Britain could leave the Union before the January 31 deadline. But a big victory or a timely exit does not mean that the road ahead is smooth. His Brexit agreement itself is controversial. Once implemented, it could erect an effective customs border between Britain and the island of Ireland. The question is what impact Mr Johnson's deal will have on the Good Friday Agreement that brought peace to Northern Ireland and to the unity of the kingdom in general. Second, a more difficult part of the Brexit process is negotiating an agreement on the UK's future relationship with the EU. Mr Johnson has promised to finish the negotiations during the 11-month transition period, but it could take years. Lastly, more than Brexit, the poll results pose administrative and constitutional challenges to the Prime Minister. In Scotland, the Scottish National Party's landslide victory, it is poised to win 48 out of the 59 Westminster seats, has already rekindled calls for a second referendum on Scottish independence. This will put the SNP on a warpath with the Tories who are opposed to a new referendum. Mr Johnson might go down in history as the Prime Minister who took the UK out of the EU. But at what cost is the question? The answer will be known in bits and pieces in the coming days. In the name of a majority, the Hindu. The NRC in Assam has given us an indication of risks involved in such exercises of inclusion and exclusion. 
The Citizenship Amendment Bill CAB passed in both houses this week promises to give the protection of citizenship to non-Muslims who fled to India to escape religious persecution in Pakistan, Bangladesh and Afghanistan. While religious persecution is a reasonable ground for protection, the problem with the CAB is that it does not include all communities that suffered religious persecution, and explicitly excludes Muslims who suffered persecution in the specified countries and other non-Muslim majority countries like Myanmar. This majoritarian notion of religion-based citizenship, although intrinsic to the Bharatiya Janata Party BJP's idea of India, is not shared by the majority of people in this country. In addition, such a view is alien to the constitutional consensus which emerged in 1950, embodying the idea of a people who committed themselves, and those governing on their behalf, to a constitutional order. Those in support of the CAB have rallied around the argument that it is non-discriminatory and its objectives are justifiable. In doing so, they have often invoked the moral imperative of correcting a perceived past wrong, in this case the partition. In the process, the CAB changes completely the idea of equal and inclusive citizenship promised in the Constitution. Changes in Citizenship Law The CAB cannot, however, be seen in isolation. It must be seen in tandem with the National Register of Citizens NRC, and other changes in the citizenship law, which have preceded it. The Home Minister and the Law Minister have clarified that the CAB and the NRC are distinct, the NRC protects the country against illegal migrants and the CAB protects refugees. This, however, is incommensurate with the election speeches made by BJP leaders. For instance, speaking in Kolkata earlier this year, Amit Shah had promised an NRC in West Bengal, but only after the passage of the CAB to ensure that no Hindu, Buddhist, Sikh, Jain and Christian refugee is denied citizenship for being an illegal immigrant. In a triumphal note after the passage of the CAB in Lok Sabha, Mr. Shah declared that a nationwide NRC would follow soon. Despite their seemingly disparate and adversarial political imperatives, the CAB and the NRC have become conjoined in their articulation of citizenship. Indeed, the two represent the tendency towards Jew sanguinous in the citizenship law in India, which commenced in 1986, became definitive in 2003, and has reached its culmination in the contemporary moment. In 2003, the insertion of the category, illegal migrants, in the provision of citizenship by birth became the hinge from which the NRC and the CAB later emerge. The Citizenship, Registration of Citizens and Issue of National Identity Cards, Rules of 2003 made the registration of all citizens of India, Issue of National Identity Cards, the maintenance of a national population register, and the establishment of an NRC by the central government compulsory. Under these rules, the Registrar General of Citizen Registration is to collect particulars of individuals and families, including their citizenship status, through a house-to-house -house enumeration. In an exception to the general rule, Assam has followed a different procedure of inviting applications with particulars of each family and individual and their citizenship status based on the NRC 1951 and electoral rolls up to the midnight of March 24, 1971. The purpose of the NRC is to sift out foreigners and illegal migrants who were referred to at different points as infiltrators and aggressors and a threat to the territory and people of India. Exempting minority groups. The second strand emerging from the 2003 amendment has taken the form of the CAB, which exempts minority communities, Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, and Christians, from three countries, Bangladesh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, from the category of illegal migrants. The CAB brings the citizenship law in line with exemptions already made in the Passport Act 1920 and Foreigners Act 1946 through executive orders in September 2015 and July 2016. It sets a cut-off date of December 31, 2014 as the date of eligibility of illegal migrants for exemption. It must be noted that a pill filed by the Assam Sanmilita Mahasangha pending before the Supreme Court has contested the deviation in the cut-off date set for Assam by the Citizenship Amendment Act 1986, March 24, 1971, from the date specified in Article 6 of the Constitution, i.e., July 19, 1948, which applies to the rest of the country.
the cab is applicable to entire India, and takes the cut-off date forward by several years. The claim that the cab does not violate the constitution is reflective of the recommendations of the Joint Parliamentary Committee, JPC. The JPC was advised by constitutional experts to use a broader category, persecuted minorities, to protect the bill from the charge of violating the right to equality in Article 14. The CAB uses the category, minority communities, and goes on to identify them on the ground of religion. The notifications of September 2015 and July 2016, which changed the Passport and Foreigners Acts, had mentioned the term, religious persecution. The consideration of religious persecution for making a distinction among persons, the JPC argued, could not be discriminatory, because the distinction was both intelligible and reasonable, satisfying the standards laid down in the Supreme Court judgment in State of West Bengal v. Anwar Ali Sarkar Habib, 1952, to affirm adherence to Article 14. Test of Reasonableness the JPC appears, however, to have overlooked the substantive conditions that the Supreme Court laid down in the same verdict. These require that the criteria of intelligibility of the differentia and the reasonableness of classification, must satisfy both grounds of protection guaranteed by Article 14, i.e., protection against discrimination and protection against the arbitrary exercise of state power. In 2009, the Delhi High Court judgment in NAS Foundation v. Government of NCT of Delhi referred to, a catena of decisions to lay down a further test of reasonableness, requiring that the objective for such classification in any law must also be subjected to judicial scrutiny. The restraint on state arbitrariness, according to the judgment, was to come from constitutional morality, which is B.R. Amdkar declared in the Constituent Assembly, was the responsibility of the state to protect. It remains a puzzle as to why the government wishes to change the citizenship law to address the problem of refugees. The JPC refers to standard operating procedures for addressing the concerns of refugees from neighboring countries. In the case of refugees from the erstwhile West Pakistan who deposed before the JPC in favor of a cab, the standard operating procedure was the grant of long-term visas leading to citizenship. One wonders how these refugees will benefit from a law which will put them through an arduous process of proving religious persecution. Immediately after partition, displaced persons constituted an administrative category, and citizenship files of 1950s tell us how district officials expedited their citizenship in the process of preparation of electoral rolls. The focus in the recent parliamentary debates, for various reasons, was the eastern borders. States in the region have resisted the cab, and simultaneously asked for an NRC. West Bengal has been an exception. The reality of imposing a national order of things through a cab and an NRC in non national spaces will unfold in future, but Assam has given us adequate evidence of the risks involved. It can only be hoped that the judiciary and civil society are able to restore constitutional and democratic politics through an exercise of counter majoritarian power in a context where electoral gains have determined political choices. Inupama Roy teaches at the Center for Political Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Improving the Code, The Indian Express. By Editorial, updated, December 14, 2019, 12 hours 36 minutes and 29 seconds am. The decision to ring fence assets of companies comes at a time when there have been instances of government agencies initiating action against companies whose resolution process has been completed. On Wednesday, the Union Cabinet approved amendments to the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code, IBC, aimed at strengthening its functioning. The amendments seek to ring fence assets of companies from offenses committed by the previous management or promoters. They have also sought to raise the minimum threshold for initiating the resolution process, and have clarified that licenses, permits and clearances cannot be suspended during the moratorium period. Each of these amendments, designed to address specific concerns, will help reduce investor uncertainty, and go a long way in shoring up confidence in the resolution process. The decision to ring fence assets of companies comes at a time when there have been instances of government agencies initiating action against companies whose resolution process has been completed. 
A case in point is the complication that arose in JSW Steel's plan to acquire Bouchon Power and Steel BPSL, with the Enforcement Directorate attaching some of BPSL's assets. While under the law, dues owed to the central government rank below those due to financial creditors, the lack of clarity on the issue injected a degree of uncertainty in the process, led to delays, and disincentivized buyers. The amendment now seeks to address this issue. The cabinet has also increased the minimum threshold for initiating the resolution process. In the case of real estate projects, the minimum number of applicants has been increased to 100 or 10 percent of the total applicants. This is designed to bring an end to the filing of frivolous cases in the NCLT. Further, by ensuring that licenses, permits, concessions, and clearances are not terminated, suspended or renewed during the moratorium period, the amendment seeks to ensure the continuation of a business is a going concern. It will help preserve its value and retain its attractiveness for prospective buyers. These latest amendments come after the Supreme Court judgment in the case of S.R. Steele that restored the primacy of the Committee of Creditors on the issue of distribution of funds from the sale of stressed assets. Coupled with that judgment, these amendments address some of the remaining contentious issues surrounding the functioning of the IBC. The government should now step up its efforts to ensure that the promise of speedy resolution, one of the most appealing aspects of the IBC, is delivered upon. For all the latest opinion news, download Indian Express app. Zero comments asterisk. Asterisk the moderation of comments is automated and not cleared manually by IndianExpress.com. Brush with the past, the Indian Express. By editorial, updated, December 14, 2019, 12 hours 42 minutes and 9 seconds am. The most striking drawing also tells a story, a hunting scene in which the human figures are not completely human, but have animal attributes. The recent dating of cave art near Makassar on the Indonesian island of Sulawesi to a staggering 44,000 years ago will change the way in which the prehistory of art is conceived. For years, the Eurocentric view, built upon the exemplars of Lascaux, Altamira and Lamarque, had been yielding ground to older finds in Australia, South Africa and Indonesia. Now, Sulawesi has trumped the rest of the world. The finds there are not new, technically, since they were known locally for a long time. And one of the motifs, the human hand outlined an ochre, saying, very powerfully, I was here, is a common sign in prehistoric art the world over. What's new is the antiquity of the artwork, arrived at by dating the mineral patina covering it. But the most striking drawing also tells a story, a hunting scene in which the human figures are not completely human, but have animal attributes. Are we seeing the first evidence of totemism and shamanism, in which humans identify with an animal and try to assume its powers? This must remain a matter of speculation, but nevertheless, this single-panel comic strip from 44 millennia ago is clearly evidence that the human imagination is immeasurably old. Abstract and symbolic thinking was at least as important for the development of sapiens as the opposable thumb that held the paintbrush. It made religion, philosophy, cooperation and culture possible, and paved the way from magic and mystery to Boolean algebra and cubism. The finds in Indonesia reveal not only the prehistory of art, but also that of the human mind. A New Britain, The Indian Express. By Editorial, updated, December 14, 2019, 12 hours 33 minutes and 44 seconds am. This election was, first and foremost, an attempt by Johnson to secure legitimacy for a hurried Brexit deal. Parliament had insisted on a more considered approach. Conservative leader and UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson's promise to get Brexit done, has found unexpectedly wide resonance with the people of Great Britain. With 364 seats out of 650 in the House of Commons, the election marks the largest victory for the Tories in recent memory. That the Conservatives were able to breach traditional bastions of the Labour Party, including in North England, and erode its working class base, signals the entrenching of the disenchantment with globalisation and European integration. In 2016, when Britain chose to exit the EU after a referendum, it marked the beginning of the West's retreat from the global order it had set up, and the liberal values that shored it up. 
Nearly four years later, even as the complexities and costs of Brexit have become apparent, the British people have chosen to overwhelmingly back it once again. For the UK, in the short term, the verdict holds an answer on how to proceed on a vexed question. But it has also raised more fundamental and complex concerns on the relationship between democracy, liberal values and populism. This election was, first and foremost, an attempt by Johnson to secure legitimacy for a hurried Brexit deal. Parliament had insisted on a more considered approach. The Conservative PM can now ensure that the deal is pushed through by the January 31 deadline. For Jeremy Corbyn, who has pushed Labour more to the left, this is the third consecutive electoral defeat. In the near future, the prospects for both Corbyn and Labour appear dim. But even for PM Johnson, the road ahead will be challenging. He must now rise to the more arduous task of steering Britain through life after Brexit. This will involve negotiating new trading arrangements with the EU, the UK's largest trading partner, along with rejoining the WTO and unveiling a new strategy for the country's economic growth. Another problem that will confront the new government comes from within the UK. The anti-Brexit Scottish National Party has won in 48 of the 59 seats in Scotland, and it could push for another referendum on Scottish independence. As new border mechanisms come into play between the UK and Ireland after Brexit, Johnson must pay heed to Irish concerns. As Britain leaves Europe, India may need to boldly reimagine the bilateral relationship. Delhi needs to look beyond the questions of Pakistan and Kashmir and seize the new opportunities for trade with Britain. As Tories revive the British interest in the Commonwealth, India has an opportunity to restructure this organisation. Britain will now likely try and recover a global role for itself, and reclaim its maritime orientation, on this front, there will be much Delhi could do with London. To succeed, though, Delhi needs to get its own house in order, especially on the economic front. An India that turns on itself at home and retreats into protectionist mode will find it hard to engage the new Britain. For all the latest opinion news, download Indian Express app. Tags. Boris Johnson. Brexit. UK elections. Scars of cab protests will further burn bridges between northeast and rest of India, the Indian Express. Written by Shuhas Palshikar, updated, December 14, 2019, 10 hours 53 minutes and 16 seconds am. In the domain of mass protests, two very different strands of opposition are emerging. One is from Assam and Tripura. File photo. Parliament has passed the Citizenship Amendment Bill. The debate over the bill bears testimony to the significance of the values of constitutionalism and secularism and the importance of icons like Gandhi and Ambedkar. For, in defending the bill, the ideological deceit of the BJP, along with its cowardice, could only hide behind these fig leaves. Nowhere in the debates has the BJP or its supporters shown the courage to say that they want to change the basis of what constitutes citizenship. The constant refrain is that what they are doing is true secularism and that even Ambedkar would have been happy with what is being done. This situation is compounded by a combination of overuse and abandonment of those same values and icons by the secular forces. For long, secular politics has resorted to these values and icons without bothering to infuse among the masses their implicit message and meaning. They have also taken recourse to the selective or symbolic use of these ideological and intellectual resources. Thus, Ambedkar or Gandhi are conveniently used for limited purposes, leaving the public exposed to distortion, fraud and rank falsehood in the name of the constitution, Ambedkar or Gandhi. No wonder, the larger public, which was mostly unconcerned about the cab during the Lok Sabha election, Lochnady's pre-election survey showed that over three-fourths of the respondents did not know about the cab, is now willing to be convinced that the bill is fair and does not violate the constitution nor deviates from the ideas of Gandhi and Ambedkar. Such a complete rigging of public discourse has probably never happened in our democratic history so far. Now that the bill is passed, what are the pathways of opposition and democratic recovery? The first is public campaigning over values, ideas and ideals. Eminent citizens, have signed letters, scholars are writing in public media, small groups of activists are trying to mobilize public opinion. 
there have been more dramatic individual cases of civil disobedience, protest and sacrifice. These are morally valuable, intellectually rewarding and ideologically necessary actions. Yet they are most likely to lack real political traction. 1. Because they are isolated. 2. Because the present regime is not sensitive to such critical responses. And 3. Because these protests would mostly lack mass participation. The other route is institutional. Parliament has chosen to pass the bill speedily. Now if the law is challenged, will the judiciary dispose of it equally quickly? Will it stick to its own basic structure ruling? These are complex matters and have been dealt with in these columns, the morning after cab, Pratap Banu Mehta, i.e., December 12. If one goes by that assessment, there is not much to be gained from the judicial route. Another institutional response that has already emerged can be characterized as the crisis of the federal structure. With the abrogation of Article 370, the practice of asymmetric federalism was abandoned. But the center has revived it in the Northeast in order to placate anti-cab public anger in the region. Will the center similarly address anger in Assam and Tripura? Now, some state governments have declared that they will not abide by the changes in the citizenship law. While this might not have much legal significance, such declarations signify another flashpoint. In the domain of mass protests, two very different strands of opposition are emerging. One is from Assam and Tripura. This is mainly in response to the fear that the change will allow Bangla Hindus to claim citizenship. This has the local versus Bengali dimension. This protest has two layers within it. 1. It portends a rupture in the sketchy peace brought about by the Assam Accord. 2. Exclusion of some territories of the Northeast tends to fracture the fragile internal balance among states and communities of the region. This is a huge challenge and while the government is sure to quell the protests, the scars will further burn bridges among communities within the region and between the Ney and rest of India. While, at the moment, attention is focused on this protest because of its severity, another muted opposition, more about the signal given by the amendment, may begin to take shape among Muslims. Because, along with consolidating a Hindu vote bank, the changes unambiguously send a message to the Muslims about their status, that they will be tolerated, but just that. The danger, here, is apparent. Besides the specter of a Hindu-Muslim divide, this could further ghettoize and communalize Muslim politics. The politics of the Muslim community often shows a tendency to slip into the hands of the more orthodox, conservative elements. Like the Ayodhya agitation, this moment too, further erodes the possibility of a liberal, internally progressive leadership among Muslims. Muslim mobilization will give the appearance of democratization but at the same time it will remain blind to questions of internal democracy and intercommunal harmony. Both these protests will be most certainly discredited, divided, and suppressed. The festering wound will remain, but the system will ignore that. After all, non-secular and non-democratic nations are often built on the debris of not just principles and aspirations, but also of actual people, the opponents and the protesters. At the same time, protests in the Northeast and among Muslims will disappoint the old world secularists. While they follow entirely different, and even somewhat contradictory, logic, they do not necessarily flow from the abstract principles of secularism and religious non-discrimination as foundational values of the Constitution. Therein probably lies the most critical lesson from the cab controversy. Democratic struggles for high principles do not happen in a vacuum, nor do they occur on absolutely abstract principles, howsoever lofty. The limitation of liberalism is that it expects abstract rationality to win politically in favor of principles whereas democratic struggles are mainly about the here and now, which is less about principles. Principles get strength only collaterally. If one recalls the Ayodhya agitation, besides being similarly anti-Muslim, it was a warning that ordinary Hindus, and ordinary Muslims, were not interested in questions of secularism as a principle or democracy as an abstract phenomenon of negotiation and compromise. Similarly, the idea of social justice could get traction only when it became a clumsy and controversial site for contesting interests of different social sections. The current debates over the idea of India are unfortunately happening in a world of imbalance.
On the one hand, is the romance with principles and deployment of icons emptied of meaning willfully by the supporters themselves, and on the other hand, a clear-headed project of telling one community that it owns this land and therefore the ideas that should govern it. No expert is needed to tell us what the outcome will be, unless principles are married to lived realities and actual group anxieties. This article first appeared in the print edition on December 14, 2019 under the title, Politics After Cab. Cab will end persecution of those for whom partition is an ongoing reality, the Indian Express. Written by Arjun Ram Meghval, updated, December 14, 2019, 10 hours 55 minutes and 19 seconds am. At the beginning of 1950, resulting from the religious persecution of Hindus in erstwhile East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, lakhs of Hindus left their homes and came to India forever. Express Archives. The Lok Sabha witnessed a historic moment at the stroke of midnight on December 9 with the passage of the Citizenship Amendment Bill Cab 2019, which seeks to further expand the ambit of religious freedom by enabling illegal migrants to become Indian citizens, those who had earlier fled from the neighboring countries, that is, Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan, because of religious persecution and a terrible life. India has a long history as a secular democracy where religious communities of every faith have thrived. The CAB has emerged as rights and relief giver to these religiously persecuted illegal migrants including Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, Parsis and Christians from Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan. The exclusion of Muslims from the ambit of the bill flows from the obvious reality that the three countries, Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Pakistan, are Islamist, as stated in their own constitutions. Over the course of history their actions, of targeting minorities for conversion or harassment, is clearly visible from the fact that the minority population in Pakistan has decreased from 23% in 1947 to 3.7% in 2011. Similarly, the minority population in Bangladesh has decreased from 22% in 1947 to 7% in 2011. At the beginning of 1950, resulting from the religious persecution of Hindus in erstwhile East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, lakhs of Hindus left their homes and came to India forever. Syama Prasad Mukherjee, then minister in the interim government, urged strong action against Pakistan, but Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru signed a pact with Liaquat Ali Khan, Pakistan's Prime Minister. In protest, Mukherjee resigned from the central cabinet two days before the pact and devoted himself wholeheartedly to the cause of the refugees. After resigning from the Union Cabinet during the statement in Provisional Parliament on April 19, 1950, Mukherjee pointed out the concerns of refugees, at that time, partition, little knowing that I would join the first Central Cabinet, I along with others, gave assurances to the Hindus of East Bengal, then East Pakistan and now Bangladesh, stating that if they suffered at the hands of the future Pakistan government, if they were denied elementary rights of citizenship, if their lives and honor were jeopardized or attacked. Free India would not remain an idle spectator and their just cause would be boldly taken up by the government and people of India. He further said, let us not forget that the Hindus of East Bengal are entitled to the protection of India, not on humanitarian considerations alone, but by virtue of their sufferings and sacrifices, made cheerfully for generations, not for advancing their own parochial interests, but for laying the foundations of India's political freedom and intellectual progress. At this juncture, it is important to recall the noted scholar, activist and voice of the Dalits, Jojendranath Mandal, who traveled to Pakistan and returned to India very soon due to the growing hostility of Pakistan on minorities. Born on January 29, 1904, in the Namasudra untouchable, community of erstwhile Bengal, Jojendranath Mandal became an elected member of the Bengal Legislative Assembly from Bakarganj Northeast General Rural Constituency in 1937. He had also established the Bengal branch of the All India Scheduled Caste Federation, which was led by B. R. Ambedkar nationally. After partition in 1947, Mandal became a member of the Constituent Assembly and then highest-ranking Hindu minister, first law and labor minister of Pakistan. His time as a Hindu minister in the Muslim-majority Pakistan remained one under suppression. 
Such dynamics, eventually, led to a situation where, in his resignation letter dated October 8, 1950, and addressed to Prime Minister Liaquat Ali Khan, Mandal highlighted the plight of Hindu minorities, their forced conversion and suppression, and their general dismal future, I can no longer afford to carry this load of false pretensions and untruth on my conscience and I have decided to offer my resignation as your minister, which I am hereby placing in your hands and which, I hope, you will accept without delay. You are of course at liberty to dispense with that office or dispose of it in such a manner as may suit adequately and effectively the objectives of your Islamic State. On April 8, 1950, the Nehru Liaquat Agreement was signed regarding the security and rights of minorities in India and Pakistan in New Delhi. It clearly says, the members of minorities shall have equal opportunities with members of the majority community to participate in the public life of their country, to hold political or other offices, and to serve in their country's civil or armed forces. India has constantly ensured the protection of minorities and a testimony to this fact is that the Muslim population in India has increased from 9.8% in 1951 to 14.8% in 2011. Pakistan did not honor its commitments though, and religious persecution of minorities continued there. Also, after exactly six months from the date of the Nehru Liaquat Agreement, Mandal resigned from the ministerial post of the Pakistan government and returned to India, which clearly became an example of the failure of the treaty. During a detailed discussion on the citizenship-related Article 5 and 6 in the Constituent Assembly on August 10, 1949, Ambedkar pointed out that It is not possible to cover every kind of case for a limited purpose, namely, the purpose of conferring citizenship on the date of commencement of the Constitution. If there is any category of people who are left out by the provisions contained in this amendment, we have given power to Parliament subsequently to make provision for them. Similarly, Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, Jains, Parsis and Christians from neighboring nations fled to India and are facing hardships as they reside, illegally, in various parts of India. Many institutions, NGOs and civil society groups are continuously deliberating and advocating the easing of the lives of minority refugees who still believe that the partition is not yet over for them. However, the passage of the bill in both houses of parliament will give relief to these minorities, illegal migrants, who have entered India without valid documents. In the border areas of Rajasthan, more than 25,000 refugees who have migrated from Pakistan will be benefited. It will empower refugee communities to improve their living conditions and also provide a more secure future for their children, besides promoting communal harmony in the border areas of Rajasthan by highlighting shared traditions and encouraging collaboration in the preservation of culture by adding more color to the diversity of India. Now, they will not only get citizenship rights but also a legitimate shot at rehabilitation, livelihood and education, with dignity an opportunity to rebuild their lives. Under the leadership of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, the government has sought to complete what the Nehru Liaquat Pact could not do so far. Home Minister Amit Shah has explained the intent of the bill in Parliament and meticulously clarified how the proposed cab is going to complete this unfinished agenda, and how it will become a boon for all the victims of partition. This historic move of granting citizenship rights to all these minorities will bring them under the umbrella of mainstream development and various welfare programs of the government. It is a moment of pride for all of us as this step will further strengthen India's centuries-old ethos of assimilation and belief in humanitarian values. A promise kept, a mandate betrayed. Written by Arupa Kalita Patangia, updated, December 14, 2019, 9 hours 44 minutes and 27 seconds am. The people of Assam have been opposing the cab for various reasons. Illustration by C.R. Sasakumar. Even though people in Assam have been agitating strongly against the Citizenship Amendment Bill, the BJP government didn't pause to reconsider its decision to introduce it in the Rajya Sabha. It left no stone unturned to muster the votes needed in the House to pass the bill. The people of Assam have been opposing the cab for various reasons. There are those who oppose it for its communal, divisive and unconstitutional character. Others oppose it because it is going to make the NRC in Assam useless and nullify the Assam Accord. 
Some others are opposing it for it will give legitimacy to illegal Hindu immigrants while depriving their Muslim counterparts of citizenship and sending them to detention camps. Another reason, the most emotionally charged one, is the apprehension of the indigenous Assamese people that it will open the floodgates for the Hindu Bengalis of Bangladesh, who may enter Assam in great numbers. The fear is that this will jeopardize the already precarious existence of the indigenous Assamese people, who will be outnumbered. There is fear that the language and culture of the indigenous people will be wiped out and they will be reduced to second-class citizens in their homeland. It may be argued that such fear is not well-founded, since the Hindus of Bangladesh are in no hurry to come to Assam, given that the condition in Bangladesh is not so inimical towards them at the moment, though they have suffered a lot, even in the recent past. However, it may be pointed out that with the cab in place, any change in the political climate of Bangladesh, that is, if the reins of power are captured by the fundamentalists at any future date, Hindus there could be tempted to escape religious persecution and crossover, secure in the knowledge that India will give them shelter. The Assamese people fear that in such a scenario, Assam will suffer. Thus, the very idea of the cab is fraught with danger to the indigenous people of Assam. In the aftermath of the passage of the bill in the Rajya Sabha, there has been relentless agitation in Assam. There is a feeling of humiliation, insult, neglect and a sense of betrayal that has stung the people. As a result, they have taken to the streets in large numbers, protesting against the BJP government, even defying the curfew that has been clamped in Guwahati and a number of other towns. The situation is extremely tense and uncertain and it is very difficult to say what course the movement will take in the days to come. Unlike during the Assam agitation, there is hardly any acknowledged leadership and the outpouring on the streets seems mostly spontaneous. Incidents of violence and arson are being reported. At least two people have been killed in police firing. If the government does not want the agitation to escalate further, it should stall the bill, even though it has been passed in both houses. It should reach out to the people of Assam with a sincere and firm assurance that the cab will not be imposed in the state without the consent of its indigenous people. People are wary of the vague promises of constitutional safeguards for the language, culture, political and other rights, including the right to the land, the recent withdrawal of Article 370 of the Constitution with respect to the erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir is being cited as an example of the unreliability of such safeguards. People are also questioning why such safeguards were not implemented before the bill was introduced in Parliament. Assam voted the BJP to office despite the fact that the party's leaders, including Amit Shah and Hemanta Biswa Sarma, had declared in no uncertain terms that they would reintroduce the cab. They had, however, postponed placing the bill in the Rajya Sabha during the first term of the Modi government for fear of not being able to pass it. Even before the election, people in Assam had been agitating against the bill, and it was largely assumed that the party would fare badly because of the agitation. Strangely, that did not happen and the BJP won handsomely. In hindsight, we may explain the BJP victory in Assam bearing in mind two factors. 1. Sarbananda Sanawal, the chief minister of Assam, a charismatic leader enjoying the people's love and trust, won the confidence of the people as he declared that he would do nothing that would harm the Assamese people. 2. The BJP government was displaying the welcome intention to fight corruption, which had been so rampant under the previous Congress government. People were full of high hopes, convinced that here was a government that meant business. However, as the days passed, those hopes began to give way to resignation, with the people, once again, realizing that promises are made to be broken. The BJP government failed to realize that the trust placed on it was waning which is why Sanawal and company didn't take the protests against the cab seriously, dismissing the outcry as a conspiracy of a disgruntled elite without any mass base. They were not entirely mistaken. The people still had great trust in Sanawal, who was once hailed as a Jatiyo Nayak, national hero. They believed that he would not let something like the cab happen. Nobody, not least the BJP, had any inkling of the enormity of the public outrage and anger that erupted once the cab was passed. 
One thing is certain, even Sanawal will have a tough time assuaging the hard feelings of the Assamese who so naively and unquestioningly put their faith in their Jatio Nayak, Sorba Dada many youth of the state. It is fair to assume that we will not see the end of the agitation very soon, since people are talking of continuing the protests even while preparing to challenge the cab in the Supreme Court. Let us see how the government responds to the demands of the people in the wake of the massive protests taking place in the state. Patangia is a Guwahati-based novelist and short story writer in Assamese. She won the Sahitya Akademi Award in 2014. What is Cab? Written by Apurva Visvanath, Kabir Farak, New Delhi, updated, December 14, 2019, 8 hours 36 minutes and 16 seconds am. Citizenship Amendment Law Protests, during a protest in Guwahati on Thursday, December 12, 2019. AP Photo, Anupam Nath. The Citizenship Amendment Bill, CAB, became law after receiving the President's assent on Thursday, following a bruising debate in Parliament. Assam has been in the throes of violence since Wednesday, when Raja Sabha took up the bill after it was passed in Lok Sabha, with its capital under indefinite curfew, an army and paramilitary columns rolling across multiple towns. At least three opposition-ruled states, Kerala, Punjab and West Bengal have said they will not implement the new citizenship law, and legal challenges have been made in the Supreme Court. Follow live updates on protests over Citizenship Amendment Bill CAB. Try watching this video on, or enable JavaScript if it is disabled in your browser. Why is a change in the law, which the government claims is sympathetic and inclusionary, being called unconstitutional and anti-Muslim, and triggering such powerful reactions? Why is Assam in particular seeing such strong protests? In Assam, what is primarily driving the protests is not who are excluded from the ambit of the new law, but how many are included. The protesters are worried about the prospect of the arrival of more migrants, irrespective of religion, in a state whose demography and politics have been defined by migration. The Assam Movement, 1979-85, was built around migration from Bangladesh, which many Assamese see as a threat to their culture and language, besides putting pressure on land resources and job opportunities. The protesters' argument is that the new law violates the Assam Accord of 1985, which sets March 24, 1971 as the cutoff for Indian citizenship. This is also the cutoff for the National Register of Citizens, NRC, in Assam, whose final version was published this year. Under the new law, the cutoff is December 31, 2014, for Hindus, Christians, Sikhs, Parsis, Buddhists and Jains from Pakistan, Bangladesh and Afghanistan. It has become controversial largely because it excludes Muslims. Click to enlarge. Under the earlier law, how could these categories of people apply for Indian citizenship? Under Article 6 the Constitution, a migrant from Pakistan, part of which is now Bangladesh, is to be granted if she entered India before July 19, 1948. In Assam, which has seen large-scale migration from East Pakistan, later Bangladesh, a migrant will get citizenship if she entered the state before the 1971 date mentioned in the Assam Accord. As far as illegal immigrants are concerned, India does not have a national policy on granting asylum or refugee status. The Home Ministry, however, has a standard operating procedure for dealing with foreign nationals who claim to be refugees. The government has dealt with refugees on a case-by-case -case basis by either granting them work permits or long-term visas. Significantly, there was no provision in the Citizenship Act to grant citizenship particularly to minorities or refugees till the latest amendment. What are the citizenship laws for others? Under the The Citizenship Act, 1955, there are four ways to obtain citizenship. Citizenship by birth, in 1955, the law provided that anyone born in India on or after January 1, 1950 would be deemed a citizen by birth. This was later amended to limit citizenship by birth to those born between January 1, 1950 and January 1, 1987. It was amended again by the Citizenship Amendment Act, 2003, those born after December 3, 2004 will be deemed a citizen of India by birth if one parent is an Indian and the other is not an illegal immigrant. 
So, if one parent is an illegal immigrant, the child born after 2004 will have to acquire Indian citizenship through other means, not simply by birth. The law describes an illegal migrant as a foreigner who, I, enters the country without valid travel documents, like a passport and visa, or he, enters with valid documents, but stays beyond the permitted time period. Citizenship by descent, a person born outside India and who has at least one Indian parent will be granted citizenship provided that the birth is registered within one year with the Indian consulate in the jurisdiction. Citizenship by registration, this is for persons related to an Indian citizen through marriage or ancestry. Citizenship by naturalization, Section 6 of the Citizenship Act states a certificate of naturalization can be granted to a person who is not an illegal immigrant and has resided in India continuously for 12 months before making an application. Additionally, in the 14 years before the 12-month period, the person must have lived in India for at least 11 years, relaxed to 5 years for the categories covered under the new amendment. Waiver, if in the opinion of the central government, the applicant has rendered distinguished service to the cause of science, philosophy, art, literature, world peace or human progress generally, it may waive all or any of the conditions in the act. This is how the Dalai Lama or Adnan Sami, the Pakistani singer, were granted Indian citizenship. Also read, how the citizenship law differs from the bill that LS cleared in January. A woman shouts slogans during a protest against the Citizenship Amendment Bill in Guwahati, Assam. Reuters, Anwar Hazarika. How many people could now be given Indian citizenship under the new law? Home Minister Amit Shah referred to the amendment as bringing relief to locks and crores of non-Muslim refugees from Pakistan, Bangladesh and Afghanistan. As of December 31, 2014, the government had identified to 89,394 stateless persons in India, according to data presented in Parliament by the Home Ministry in 2016. The majority were from Bangladesh 103, 817, and Sri Lanka 102, 467, followed by Tibet 58,155, Myanmar 12,434, Pakistan 8,799, and Afghanistan 3,469. The figures are for stateless persons of all religions. For those who came after December 31, 2014, the regular route of seeking refuge in India will apply. If they are regarded as illegal immigrants, they cannot apply for citizenship through naturalization, irrespective faux religion. Editorial, poisonous citizenship amendment bill should have been stopped in the House. The judiciary must rise to the Constitution's defense. Are the communities mentioned indeed persecuted in these three countries? In Rajya Sabha, the Home Minister relied on news reports as evidence of religious persecution against Hindus in Pakistan, ranging from forced conversion to demolition of temples. Notable examples were Asia Bibi, a Pakistani Christian convicted of blasphemy who spent eight years on death row before being acquitted by the Pakistan Supreme Court. In Bangladesh, cases of killings of atheists by Islamic militants are well documented. While Shah claimed that persecution has been rampant since the death Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, Bangladesh's present foreign affairs minister A.K. Abdul Momin has denied any religious persecution. Although Shah referred to non-Muslim religions as persecuted minorities, the law avoids using the word persecution in its text. Protesters set ablaze hoardings during their march against the citizenship amendment law in Guwahati. PTI photo. What exactly is debatable about the law, legally and constitutionally? Legal experts and opposition leaders have argued that it violates the letter and spirit of the Constitution. One argument made in Parliament is that the law violates Article 14 that guarantees equal protection of laws. According to the legal test prescribed by courts, for a law to satisfy the conditions under Article 14, it has to first create a reasonable class, of subjects that it seeks to govern under the law. Second, the legislation has to show a rational nexus between the subject and the object it seeks to achieve. Even if the classification is reasonable, any person who falls in that category has to be treated alike. 
If protecting the persecuted minorities is ostensibly the objective of the law, then the exclusions of some countries and using religion as a yardstick may fall foul of the test. Further, granting citizenship on the grounds of religion is seen to be against the secular nature of the constitution which has been recognized as part of the basic structure that cannot be altered by parliament. Shah argued that persecuted minorities in three neighboring countries, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Afghanistan, whose state religion is Islam, is a reasonable classification. Another argument is that the law does not account for other categories of migrants who may claim persecution in other countries. People take away wooden sticks from a roadblock put up by the protesters during yesterday's protest against the Citizenship Amendment Bill CAB, in Guwahati on Thursday, December 12, 2019. AP Photo, Anupam Nath. Which are these other categories? The law will not extend to those persecuted in Myanmar, Rohingya Muslims, and Sri Lanka Tamils. Shah has repeatedly made statements that not a single Rohingya Muslim will be allowed in India. Further, by not allowing Shia and Ahmadiyya Muslims who face persecution in Pakistan, or the Hazras, Tajiks and Uzbeks who faced persecution by the Taliban in Afghanistan, the law is being seen as potentially violating Article 14. In Parliament, Shah argued that Muslims can never be persecuted in Islamic countries. Defending the exclusion of Shias and Ahmadiyyas from Pakistan, BJP MP Sebramaniam Swami said a persecuted Shia would rather go to Iran than come to India. About Sri Lanka and Bhutan, Shah insisted that neither country has Islam as the state religion. Incidentally, both Bhutan and Sri Lanka offer constitutional patronage to the state religion, Buddhism. Are these persecuted groups? The second constitutional amendment in Pakistan declared the Ahmadis to be non-Muslims, and their penal code makes it criminal for Ahmadis to refer to themselves as Muslims, and places restrictions on the community including denying it the right to vote. In 2016, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom recommended declaring Pakistan a Tier 1 country of particular concern for severe violations of religious freedom under the International Religious Freedom Act. In August this year, the U.S., the U.K. and Canada expressed concerns about religious oppression in China and Pakistan in a meeting on safety of religious minorities in armed conflict. Protesters clash with security personnel in Guwahati on Thursday. PTI photo. Given that the law excludes only non-Indian Muslims, why is it being said that it is against Indian Muslims? On the face of it, the amendment is not to exclude any Indian citizen. However, the NRC in Assam and the latest citizenship law cannot be decoupled. The final NRC left out over 19 lakh people. The new law gives a fresh chance to the Bengali Hindus left out to acquire citizenship, whereas the same benefit will not be available to a Muslim left out who will have to fight a legal battle. Shah and BJP leaders have maintained that the NRC process in Assam will be replicated in the rest of the country, fueling fears among Indian Muslims. Plugged with NRC, the new amendment becomes an enabling law to potentially disenfranchise an individual of a religion not mentioned in the amendment. Politically, the law is expected to impact West Bengal and northeastern states. Assam and West Bengal head for polls in 2021. But if a nationwide NRC based on documents indeed happens, won't many Hindus also end up being excluded? Exclusion of Hindus is a possibility. However, the citizenship law can shield many such Hindus. Shah said in Parliament that no documents or proof of persecution will be asked of non-Muslim minorities when applying for citizenship. Congress leader Kapil Sibyl said in Raja Sabha that a Hindu left out of the NRC in Assam, and who will now apply under the new law, would effectively be lying. In the NRC process, an individual would have submitted an application that she is an Indian. Now, while applying for citizenship, she would have to submit that she fled Bangladesh, Afghanistan or Pakistan where she faced religious persecution. However, an exercise like the NRC, which cost approximately 12,000 crore rupees in Assam alone and took years, will be mind-boggling for all of India in terms of scale and cost.
Unlike Assam, where there was broad political and public consensus for NRC, a pan-India NRC is likely to be resisted by parties, governments, groups, and individuals. Union Home Minister Amit Shah tables the Citizenship, Amendment, Bill in Rajya Sabha. Screen grab, RSTV. Shah said in Parliament that the legislation was intended to correct the flaws of the Nehru Liaquat Pact of 1950. What was this agreement? In the aftermath of partition and the communal riots that followed, Prime Ministers Jawaharlal Nehru and Liaquat Ali Khan signed a treaty, also known as the Delhi Agreement, on security and rights of minorities in their respective countries. India had constitutional guarantees for rights of minorities and Pakistan had a similar provision in the Objectives Resolution adopted by its Constituent Assembly. Shah claims India has kept its end of the bargain while Pakistan has failed, and it is this wrong that the new law seeks to correct. Kerala, West Bengal and Punjab have refused to implement it. Can they? The non-BJP ruling parties in these states are making a political point. Citizenship, aliens and naturalization are subjects listed in List 1 of the 7th Schedule and fall exclusively under the domain of Parliament. Most states of the Northeast are, however, wholly or partially exempted under special provisions for tribal areas, such as Inner Line Permit, Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, Mizoram and now extended to Manipur, and the sixth schedule with special provisions in practically all of Meghalaya, and a large chunk of Tripura. How much of Assam is exempt? In Assam, three autonomous districts are exempted but the new law remains applicable to the major area. This also raises the question, can there be two citizenship laws applicable to the same state? Under Clause 5.8 of the Assam Accord, foreigners who came to Assam on or after March 25, 1971 shall continue to be detected, deleted and practical steps shall be taken to expel such foreigners. What is the Assam Accord and how did it lead to the NRC? It was signed on August 15, 1985 by the governments of India and Assam, and the Al-Assam Students' Union and the Al-Assam Gana Sangram Parishad in New Delhi. It came at the end of a six-year mass movement, spearheaded by students, against illegal migration from East Pakistan, Bangladesh. The process of identifying foreigners was laid down in the Illegal Migrants Determination by Tribunals, Act of 1983, applicable only to Assam. In 2005, it was struck down by the Supreme Court as unconstitutional. The petitioner, Sarbananda Sanawal, now Assam chief minister, had argued that the provisions were so stringent that it virtually made detection and deportation of illegal migrants almost impossible. The present NRC, an update of the existing NRC of 1951, began in 2013. On a litigation by NGO Assam Public Works seeking removal of names of illegal immigrants from the voters' list, the Supreme Court relied on two rulings on cases filed by Sanawal, and justified its intervention to update the NRC. The process was monitored by the Supreme Court. Express Cartoon by E. P. Unni The Home Minister assured that Assam's culture would be protected under Clause 6 of the Assam Accord. What is it about? This was added to the Assam Accord as a balancing factor. While the citizenship cut-off date for a migrant from Pakistan is July 19, 1948, for the rest of the country, the accord sets it at March 24, 1971. Because of the additional migration, Clause 6 promised that constitutional, legislative and administrative safeguards, as may be appropriate shall be provided to protect, preserve and promote the culture, social, linguistic identity and heritage of the Assamese people. This protection is covered under Section 6A of the Citizenship Act, which created special provisions as to citizenship of persons covered by the Assam Accord. The constitutional validity of Section 6A is under challenge before the Supreme Court. It has not yet been defined who will be listed as the Assamese people. A widely held view is that it should cover those who could trace their ancestry in Assam back to at least 1951, excluding citizens who came during 1951-71. A committee set up by the Center is yet to make recommendations on what form the special provisions would take, land rights, political rights, cultural preservation.
Don't miss from explained, what is USCIRF the US body that feels Amit Shah should face sanctions for cab. For all the latest explained news, download Indian Express app. Tags.